Am I am I on? Can you hear me, Andrew? Yeah, I hear you. You hear me? You hear me? Hear me now. Come in now. Listen to me later. <laughs> so uh, it's just us mice, right? It is. So your tweet about Elon Musk on SNL, Scott Johnson's like, it's a horrible choice. I want to like Scott, but I'll be like, and this is why the advertisers don't want you to book what? for Saturday Night Live. Oh, we're on air. No, no. Okay, so we're on air. We're on air. Well, there you go, everybody. <laughs> yeah, Corey, Corey, when he asked if it's just us mice, you should you should say that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, you couldn't hear him. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, man, stunt casting's been a part of SNL forever. There we go. Now I'm now I'm now I'm gone. Um. You know, I just, I think, uh, uh, the, the, the biggest thing is that our, our shattered monoculture leaves less really famous people. Like if you look at like the kind of, you know, would for the cultural attention that like a Bridgerton gets, like you would think mm -hmm. that the lead of Bridgerton would host SNL, but it's just not the same as like Seinfeld or law and order or ER or something like know. that. Bridgerton is yeah exactly so. that's why yeah I I think about like it's like I think you know people who are upset like I great I get it he's not a comedian uh I'll tell you I can name a couple actors who have been award-winning actors who have been on there who are not comedians either who had disastrous performances but nobody paid attention to more importantly it's like all the guests from like like you know all the all the politicians and stuff you know. Yeah. You oh, know. by the way, Codes from Home is pointing out that the lead from Bridgerton did host SNL, and I had no <laughs> idea that they did it. So, therefore, even more proving my point. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's... SNL is such a bizarre element of our culture, because nothing like it has ever really happened before. Nothing has really lasted so long. At this point, it's kind of famous for being famous like uh uh to the point where anybody gives a rat's ass on who's on it like like th there is an element of of distinction to it uh but we're in such a weird period of fame right now that like it was more of a reflection of elon musk than it was about snl that the that i i didn't see all of it i caught two sketches and I thought they were funny. I thought they were well written. Yeah. Like like the uh the 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 Wario courtroom sketch. Yeah. Uh you know, I think you could you could have shaved some stuff. <laughs> you know, uh you, you could have shaved it down like most SNL sketches, but the end was a funny premise. I mean, it's better than I can uh, say for most SNL sketches where they, they just kind end. of peter out. Like at least it it had an ending to the sketch that was funny. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I yeah, I you know, it, it's I don't think anybody's going to walk away going like he needs his own show, but I'm like, yeah, like I, I, I think I've seen, I, I can, the notorious appearances of actors, even a free, recent young actor, just flat, just flat. There's so many people just go on there and so flat and are clearly reading the cue cards. I'm like, like it's, it's the reason they're a guest host, yeah. you know? But meanwhile, uh, but, I mean, the, 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 what's it called? The, the Gen Z hospital sketch was like really funny and really quick. I think it was like, it was like the, the first, like, two minute and 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 five second snl sketch that i've seen in forever and it just like got in they did their thing and then they got out it was it was actually like an efficient snl sketch yeah i just i realized how alien i am from that culture i'm like i don't know what this means <laughs> no like, cap oh, uh, no cap bro what what was the bit uh elon on snl oh, no, no, no. Yeah, doing yeah. gen z hospital which uh what, what what do they do it's basically just a like a, a a standard hospital like procedural uh but everybody is just opera, using yeah. NG, like gen z slang oh that's hilarious so it's like that's like, hilarious bro what's with bestie is bestie gonna make it <laughs> bruh bruh <laughs> that's pretty good <laughs> and yeah elon is the doctor and they're like like is bestie gonna make it i'm afraid that's cap <laughs> <laughs> Third highest ratings of the season after Chappelle and Chris Rock. Uh, yeah, that that is one of the yeah, things. Yeah, he's when, really famous. When, <laughs> as it turns out, yeah. when you know who the host is, 
you're more likely to tune in because well, he's really yeah. famous. And, and the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, when SNL is at its best, it's nothing but softballs, and it's the job of insert whoever host to just go and then just you know yeah. offer that punch. Well, I mean, uh, 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 Andrew and I were, were were texting back and forth when he first got cast that I think the the greatest non actor sketch of all time is Joe Montana. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, I know the end line of that, of this sketch. <laughs> Just brilliant. It's, it's a brilliantly written sketch. It, yeah. it, Cause it, it's, it's a great concept of like, uh, of, of the subliminal, uh, uh, internal thoughts of, of a, a couple as they're going through the mating ritual. Right. It's basically the, uh, uh, it's nothing but, uh, somebody says something and then somebody else, uh, or then a voiceover says what they're thinking. Yeah, and but, it's like but Joe, it's like, like, Joe Montana's it, bit is every time he says something, it's exactly what exactly he's thinking. exactly what he exactly <laughs> what he means with the big end line being like like oh don't worry about me I'll be upstairs masturbating and then the eternal monologue is the exact same thing. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, greatest non-actor uh, 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 sketch of all time. But then Andrew, you you had the uh, uh, the 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 Nat X sketch. I forget who the was it. Uh, Seagal? Steven Seagal and Chris Rock. Yeah, which and sent me just... down a rabbit hole of watching Nat X sketches, which are <laughs> so underrated. Man, I actually yes. I, I missed out on all that. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It, the uh, only 15 minute talk show because the man won't give oh, me 30. Oh, wait, that one. Uh, uh, and the, the, the mama joke of the day and, and all that. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, white, yeah. and then the white oh. man cam. Yeah. <laughs> Just like like the handheld. Like, oh no, oh no, the white man cam. And then it puts him behind bars. <laughs> That's how you want to see me, isn't it? <laughs> uh, here, I'm going to grab a soda. Although that it did involve it did involve an excellent Daryl Hammond, uh, uh, Jesse Jackson uh, 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 impersonation that would never happen in the modern era due to the blackface. It, yeah, I was about to say, uh, if I remember correctly, they full on blackfaced him. Huh? Oh, Jimmy Fallon. Jimmy Fallon was in blackface doing Chris Rock, like uh, uh, when he was, you know, a, a, a contemporary. Yeah. Same as Kimmel. Oh God, yeah, no Here, Man oh, Show, yeah. yeah. He would do uh, uh, Carl Malone. It's different because racism didn't exist back then, guys. Yeah. Carl Malone, I've heard, uh, uh, collects semi-trucks like other rich people collect <laughs> cars. Like, he just, he just loves semi-trucks, and he, and he just collects them. Yeah, it's, there is something about... Some of these, for some reason, it seems like some of these NBA guys are very fat, like, you know, Shaquille O'Neal with the whole putting furniture and stuff together in the middle of the night. Yeah. And, you know, have kind of very interesting sort of hobbies. Um, that was my favorite story. Like he'd go to Walmart after a game and leave his credit card up front to pay for everybody's groceries and then go find something that he could buy to put together. <laughs> He still did. There was a clip of him, and and he's very social media savvy, Shaq. So so you never yeah. you never know these days, uh, uh, you know how much of it is staged. But even then, I I presume it was a real thing. But uh, there was a video of him just he was walking in to buy jewelry for something, and it was a dude buying uh you know a, a an engagement ring, and he just you know passes his credit card and is like, yeah, I'll just take care of that. Wow. hundred percent believe it. Everything I've heard about Shaquille O'Neal is yeah. like, he's just that kind of a guy. All right. Uh, cool. Are we uh, ready to roll? I'm, I'm ready to roll on my side. What about you, Andrew? Ready, ready. Uh, Good to go. Should probably bring up the, uh, our, 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 our human faces instead of the uh, weird things. I mean, yeah, I got to hit record and bring him in. And then... Okay. Yeah. Okay. You want to see yourself? What if they're wearing frightening masks? Hey. Ah. Yeah, that... There we go. I just want to make sure we're here. Brian, is that you? Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Hold, hold on. I'm not recording yet. All oh, right. Yeah. yeah no. Brian, nor gonna... Normally, normally we'll we'll bring up that just so Twitch people, if they're if they're only seeing the album, the 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 generated art, they'll yep. see faces and not the thing, so they'll know to come in. Cool. Brian, I think you're a shoe in for the assistant principal job. 
That's a good thing to tell someone who just got a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good right. looking haircut. It's a good haircut. I, 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 it's likable and trustable. I like it. <laughs> All right. Is somebody, is somebody uncertain about the haircut? Uh, yes. Uh, yesterday, I cut off the last part of the hair that I had grown out to mourn the loss of my brother, and I cut off the very last of it yesterday and broke down into tears. Um, oh, I'm sorry, because I knew that whole story, Brian. Uh, no, but today I was told I looked like an assistant principal. <laughs> so that's fine. <laughs> Brian, it's a good haircut. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> right, I, I didn't, I didn't, I'm not in your head. I know. I know. Uh, which is why I was trying not to... Not to uh, uh, give energy. All right. I'm going to start to hit the record button now. Let's do it. All right. And Andrew in three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Brian Brushwood. Yo! And Mr. Justin Robert Young. Hello! Gentlemen, there has been a project going on for several years called Breakthrough Listen. And the goal of this, it has been to, uh, it's basically, they've involved with the SETI research, which is trying to search the heavens, search the skies for signs of intelligent life. And they've had a survey now of 60 million stars, 60 million stars they've been able to listen to for some various kind of wavelengths to figure out, is there anything out there? And we can now tell you... <laughs> We haven't heard anything. <laughs> oh man, that's that's always that's always the disappointing part. But 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 I am fascinated to know um, is is there a justification and 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 I, 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 if none of us know, that's fine. But uh, I, what wavelengths do you decide to listen to and why? Probably the easiest ones to listen to <laughs> uh, yeah. because you can. Let's start there. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, that's a great question. I, I think they, they pick up the bands at which they think that they, they go for them, and they go from 0. 0.7 and 93 gigahertz. Um, and limited. The, this one was limited to the results between 1 and 8 gigahertz. Wow. Basically, they would listen for like seven hours at a time, and then they used a couple telescopes. Green Bay would Green Bay telescope listen to 11 hours. and But... They were looking for repeating things. They were looking for people intentionally trying to contact us. Yeah. Not trying to pick up, like, is that just broadcast and anything else? What, so so that, that would be, like, you know, what, what we would think of, like, as SOS or repeating signals that would be, like, like I'm looking for people. I'm looking for people. Right. I'm looking mm -hmm. for people. As, as Aimed opposed at us. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to like a, like a, a, the plot of the movie Contact, where, or, or a common trope is uh, uh, we've been broadcasting our signals everywhere and somebody heard them and learned our language and now they're invading us or whatever. Um, uh, so I, I guess it really does because, uh, for example, here on Earth, we only had a window, and tell me if this is right, uh, Andrew, uh, of maybe 150 to 200 years that we broadcast anything analog that was easy to decipher and now all of a sudden all of our digital all, all of our signals are encoded and digital and it's like it's it's going to be a lot harder for somebody to just randomly see our our chatter internally i mean we still have a lot of analog stuff out there radio a lot of other countries still do that but as far as like uh, you know but all of our stuff is sort of aimed at earth we don't overpower stuff um but yeah like if you were trying to pick up errant broadcasts or stuff like this you know the idea that you know the, the things that would be discernible you know uh that haven't been digitized has decreased and so like what what we you know you would you'd be able to figure out like well this seems like a noisy planet compared to what it should be so that's part of it but if it's around a star hard to know but also like the mount is you know we're we're here only capable of like these telescopes are only capable of looking at things that are aimed right like at us in pretty high power uh, which, which, in theory, if we're looking for an advanced civilization and they had a constraint-free economy uh, and they identified us as a likely candidate, theoretically, they would have the extra resources to just say, yeah, I don't know, take 12 satellites and just have it pulse this rhythmic thing and just see if anything happens. Yeah, and we're, you know, the, that would be, I mean, exactly. And I think the, the thing that we kind of get tripped up on is like, 
we go like, well, in advance, like we we're right now we're like, like, no, let's not tell everybody we're here, you know, because like we're like, let's not tell everybody here. And then we're kind of like, well, we're not hearing from them. Like maybe just because they're more advanced than us doesn't mean they're not paranoid, too, that, you know, like, yeah, you know, you know, they're, like they're, you know, a thousand years from now, you'd still be worried about like somebody who's 10,000 more years advanced than you. Yeah. And, and, and it's been a minute since we talked about it on the show, but I really loved that that very real realization of it's like, let's take all of the interactions of one culture in humanity, finding another culture of humanity, one that's more advanced, one that's more primitive. How did it ever work out for the more primitive? Like a hundred percent of the time, when did the primitive ones come out up, up, up top? Uh, you know, we still carry some Neanderthal DNA. <laughs> we I mean, yeah, I, I think that 30%. there's like, there, there, it's probably more complicated than just like, you know, big bank tank, little bank. Although like ultimately that's where we, we wind up understanding that there is going to be a level of hegemony when it comes to, to culture. Uh, uh, but certainly if a, a more advanced culture meets a less civilized culture, either they, the, 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 the win for the less civilized culture is staying apart. There's no world in which they combine in which the, 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 the larger culture and more advanced one is not dominant at some point. That's interesting. Um, I suppose maybe the best case scenario involves nobody approaching anybody but maybe kind of a Encyclopedia Galactica being slowly handed out star to star over hundreds of thousands of years, or you know, I. But let's let's well, let's revisit the whole. I mean, we obviously can think of the really bad examples and seems to be felt history of a higher level culture. But you know, you had uh, you take when the Roman Empire came to you. Was it really always bad? <laughs> you know, was it because they they built an I, empire? If, if they if, had to get a bunch of people. Uh, well, I, I was about to say, if you're a small village that's constantly being savaged by barbarians, then uh, you're probably like, oh, good, thank you, chariots. Yeah, they're like, we I like don't know, man. I, I took a look at the brochure. <laughs> it's a pretty good idea to get in as a franchisee to this Roman Empire thing. <laughs> like, it's 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 a, it's, a, it's a pretty sweet deal. Yeah, it's like. Uh, I would say the devastation wrought upon brought upon the Americas was really, really bad. At the time, though, some of the local tribes that teamed up with the conquistadors were like, no, we really hate the Aztecs. We really hate them. Like, yeah. We need, you know, and uh, it didn't work out well in the long run, just, just to let you know. Um, but a, a, yeah. a, a quick side jag on the Aztecs. Um, and you, you probably, and this is me just calling my friend Andrew, like, yo, man, somebody said something and I didn't really think about it. Um, uh, there was a heavy incentive for the conquistadors to overstate just how savage the Aztecs were. And I had never paused to consider that until I read those words, I believe like a few months ago, <laughs> like I just assumed that, that yeah. everything pop culture tells us about the Aztecs, that they would sacrifice children to make sure the sun rose every day was true. But then I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah, no, the con conquistadors, the only reporters about the, the ruins of the Aztecs probably had a really good reason to overstate their You're savage. Like, yeah, yeah, these guys, well, are, these guys suck. Well, <laughs> that was, there was actually a period of anthropology kind of in the 50s and 60s went back and said just that thing. Like maybe how do, why do we trust their narrative? Which is a very good point to take. Like, why do we trust their narrative? Because they're writing these things then the historical record started showing like they just have, I had a story that I didn't do here, which was like, they talked about the Cadiz stores talked about finding this uh, in the, 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 the Mexican capital originally, like this big bone, like these big, like walls of bones were bigger than they could, could imagine, which was like, you know, like murdered people and all them stacked, whatever. And this big description, I forgot what it was called. And like, that sounds a little anecdotal, you know, like, really? Like, are you guys maybe trying to make the case? And then somebody jackhammers in, digs down, and finds, holy cow, look at that giant thing of bones and stuff. <laughs> so uh, we've been finding uh, there, you know, and, and and the more we dig, the more we find, oh, well, that's not, and again, not that the things we were doing back in Europe were all that great, or the things done, the, 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 the genocide or the horrific things done to people in the Americas by Europeans. Let's not, you know, we're all, we're all, we're all like, yeah, bad. But like they've, you know, you find there that like part of the reason they were able to, you know, they were able to conquer the, the conquistadors were able to do, do so go far. So many tribes joined with them because they were so sick of what was going on because of just how 
crazy, uh, vicious and violent the cultures had become. Some of them. I mean, you know, all politics are local, right? Yeah. (laughs) Like at at, at the end of the day, uh, uh, you know, especially now, I think it's, it's fascinating as, as we have more access to history than we've ever had in, in any kind of, of human civilization that we, we always kind of process it both through our modern lens and we have more raw material to process through. And, and uh, a lot of times we kind of lose the forest for the trees. We, 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 we lose the little bit of nuance that kind of makes everything a little bit, uh, you know, make, a, make more sense. Uh, so, so I got a question, Andrew. Let's say that we had found something, a beacon from one of these stars. And uh, I, I, I think it's fair to say um, in science fiction, we have all spent a lot of time thinking about physically one, of, one species going to the other or, or whatever. But let's say, let's say that's off the table because practically speaking it is. Um, I wonder, let, let's say we wanted to be the first. Let's say we're that alien civilization. And let's say we find an Earth, you know, like there's almost certainly somebody evolving over civilization. We have a few, uh, we have about 100,000 years to spare to send a signal um, I mean, obviously the first thing you want to say is hello, hello, other world. Um, but after that, what, what do you think the moral responsibility is to begin a highly asymmetric download of information to an emerging civilization like ours? I, I think that, I think that's the moral thing to do when done right. But you, I think we'd agree but but the you don't begin is, with atomic bombs. <laughs> no, uh, you know, let let them get that out of their system. Um, the, <laughs> the problem is, is that we're individualists, right? We 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 take the individualist point of view. We want any individual within a given society to have control over their destiny. Some people look at things at the culture level and say, yes, but you're 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 erasing this culture, and the value should be letting the culture find its sort of way. You know, it's kind of like the Dawkins versus Gould, you know, the gene versus the animal. And then you get in kind of the versus the culture sort of thing. Like I, I look at, I, I think those dudes who are, you know, and the, the, was it the, uh, the islands in the Samuelson islands, whatever in the middle in Indonesian ocean and whatever there's people out there and these sort of like living in huts and stuff like, I think oh, we uh, could totally- sorry. I, I, no, I'm st- is it islands in the stream? That is what we are. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> not islands in the stream, oh, okay. Brian. Uh, but but uh, but, uh, sorry, are you talking about the cargo cults? Uh, or no, 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 no. Uh, there's we still have like kind of basically uncontacted tribes. You know, people who are you know these these small the uh, the I'm uh, getting the region the Andalusian Andy. Uh, uh, let me pull up the name just so I can. Uh, just, well, yeah. While you're doing that, uh, we're going to sing I, "Islands in the Stream." No, Islands I, in the Stream. <laughs> that is what we are. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I do know that okay. uh, uh, on one of the on on the tour we took uh, of Hawaii, they talked about how there is one island where they're you know it's dwindling smaller and smaller, and uh, like they're like, no, we're going to preserve this culture. We're going to preserve this culture, and then teenagers come and they're like. Yeah, I hear about these things called cell phones and yeah, and Facebook rule. So I'm <laughs> well, gonna go. Bye. <laughs> and and not and I don't want to pick on any kind of particular culture because things are very very common. But you know, we go far enough back into our family trees and we find people who are living in these isolated little villages and stuff. And everybody is related to everybody, and that ends up having its own complications. And too, is you get you get a lack of genetic diversity. And there are some people like yeah, but you know. So I was speaking to the people who were in the uh, the Sintelese people in the, in the Andaman Island in the Bay of Bengal. Um, they don't like they reject contact. Blah blah blah. I'm like, well, yeah, the people running it kind of reject contact. Yeah. The same as some of these like Jack Mormon groups that like you know the, all the elders control the women <laughs> yeah. in the town reject contact. Uh, uh, I'll have you know, both Elder Thomas and Father Brother Man and their twelve wives, Father Brother <laughs> Man, have yeah. rejected all contact. So I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> yeah. So that's my thing. Is like people are like, oh no, they don't. I'm like, did you? Did you do a survey? Did did we do a survey where we asked, like, well, that's not their way. Like, okay, so you're already agreeing that that the males get to control that society and the destiny of every female and every child there. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's your Western way of looking at things. Like, no, we 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 agreed that's bad here. You know. Yeah, I mean, uh, 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 it is it is it is a question of of how 
I mean, I think we've 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 done our fair share of like clowning of the the the, the Star Trek Prime Directive and stuff like that. But there is there is this question of of exactly like how much do you want to like uh, on on what is the most respectful way to approach another culture one one that you fundamentally have differences on like at, at what point does morality kick in if you believe that there are like fundamental underpinnings that that you don't think are right uh it, it, Andrew Main every so often I share an idea with you that I really think in the bottom of my heart is kind of a clever idea for a science fiction book. And I'm always hoping you'll steal them and write them up. And you always tell me I should write that book, but I think I just had one. Um, I'm trying Father to brother man. <laughs> <laughs> and the islands in the stream. Father brother, man. <laughs> Father no. brother, man. That is who he is. With his no. 12 wives and his 50 kids. <laughs> So let's say you are a alien race in a constraint free economy and hundreds of thousands of years are nothing to your civilization or the, your robotic children, or let's say, let's say your civilization died, but, 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 but your, your robot, uh, uh, creations have a directive, which is to share your story. Um, just randomly, I tripped uh, across in my mind a couple of articles I read in the last week about you know whether Beetlejuice is or is not close to a supernova or whatever. And it occurred to me that if what you want to do is share information, you wouldn't just target lasers from your planet, uh, beaming it to likely candidates. Um, uh, we've talked about a Dyson sphere before, which is when you perfectly harvest all of the energy around a star... Uh, and in fact, one of our favorite books, um, uh, oh, uh, the one before Judas and Unchained. Pandora Star. Pandora, Pandora Star, Star, right. Uh, uh, basically, the opening scene of that book is somebody's looking at a star, and then it just winks out. And the whole planet freaks out because they put together, somebody just made a Dyson Sphere, which means we're not alone in the universe, which means, you know, at any point, this, you know, advanced civilization yeah. could destroy us and all that stuff. So what I wonder if, in the spirit of a Dyson Sphere... Um, if you, if 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 you had unlimited resources, it would seem like if what you want to do is share information, imagine a record groove, but imagine an, a series of satellites placed around, say, Betelgeuse or or some other planet that is poised, or sorry, uh, some other star that is poised to go supernova. You can know for a fact that any civilization around is going to watch. For, for that thing to explode. And when it does explode, everybody's going to definitely watch. And I wonder if a series of satellites, uh, based on what their chemical composition, you couldn't set up a binary on-off, on-off in Sirius. Uh, so, so, I, you know, so as it goes out and explodes, it's essentially like a, a, a record groove transmitting everywhere with the power of a supernova. And those who are bright enough to tune in or record it will be able to decode the entire message from beginning to end as if it's an intergalactic press release. You burn it into the retinas. Uh, <laughs> and it's no, but, oh. Well, like, like Beetlejuice, when it does go supernova, it's at a safe distance. We're going to watch uh, uh, Beetlejuice when it goes supernova. It'll be bright enough to see during the daytime. Oh, wow. It'll be um, as bright as, as about a half moon uh, at night. Uh, uh, we're going to, we're going to have uh, like, like it will be the event of, 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 you know, our quadrant or whatever. Yeah. Um, I, is it, it, it does your Andrew main brain think there's anything to that either as a science fiction idea yeah, there, or in reality? I mean, there's, that's one of the things that's been proposed in the search is steady is the idea is like, could, are there ways to use large events, like large events, like, uh, um, magnetars and stuff and putting things in orbit or trying to do stuff to manipulate these things so you could kind of like create something and the case of that like to really i mean supernova is big so you would the level of engineering to probably and i could be guessing the level of you know engineering to be able to do something to sort of send us a signal you could kind of just send it but if you have that though but you take on that theme though like you it, could it, be it, doing it would have to be hundreds of millions or billions of satellites strategically placed with different markers that would interact as they got blasted yeah. away. 
there might be but there, there might be other if you have that there might be related ways you could do stuff because like if you started moving planets around you know i mean you could you could also like uh, polaris i love as a star because polaris is like literally like straight up yeah. straight up it, it, the fact that you go like which way is north i don't know hey look there's a star up there i'm <laughs> like if you want to go look for something like you know that would be like hit your clue dummies we we put a star directly <laughs> over your north pole mm -hmm. like that's the clue but the result yeah. is patreon.com slash weird things <laughs> where you can support this very show thank you to everybody who's already done it Headed on over there to patreon.com slash weird things. You get your custom RSS feed. Not only do you get weird things, but you also get after things. Our show where we talk about creativity and entrepreneurship and how to make your way in the digital world faster than anybody else. It's so simple. Patreon.com slash weird things. All right. Now you got me thinking like now I'm thinking like if we're doing millions, uh, or hundreds of millions, billions of satellites or whatever, then it's like you make them out of different, um, uh, 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 chemical or different different elements, you know, like basically copper flashes green when it gets burnt up or whatever. You line them all up in this just amazingly long line, and you throw them at a star that you know will be interesting to a lot of people. And then somebody at some point starts looking. That's so crazy. I, I think the thing that you just got the thing to keep in mind is that the amount that you would need to put there to make to stand out from the noise of all the stuff in the star, but it's not, it, but if you're working on a really long time frame, it might be like, ah, oh, let's, let's move this nebula there or whatever. Like I, yeah, I guess I, I, I I'm thinking I I'm, I'm being very, very generous in terms of like, this is a dying civilization that spends their last thousand generations building robots that are intelligent enough to carry out the directive of tell our story. I, yeah, I'd say if you have that kind of resource, there might be more efficient ways to You might be able it. to save yeah. your civilization. Oh yeah, no, that's a good point. Like <laughs> you might be able to go away to another place. It's that Sam Kinison bit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like this is sand. <laughs> you know, it's gonna be in a thousand years. <laughs> It's like, uh, oh, I like I, we're, we're only, we're directing our entire economy to the robots that <laughs> tell our story. But what about food, father, brother, man? We won't need food. We'll have our story told. Ask your seventh mother to cook third breakfast. Uh, yeah, to cook shoe leather. <laughs> Are you, you know, the thing that you, you get into the idea of like, you know what we need is... Let's imprint our story on them in their own DNA and a little thing. And we've developed a robot called a virus. Yeah. And we'll send this to Earth. <laughs> Will it break down? Ah, it'll take a few million years. Yeah, they'll you know? figure it out. That way, those sauropods walking around will know our story. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, at that point, I would imagine you you get a little bit desperate. And you're like, uh, let's just make them into us. <laughs> just see, just... Yeah. just Hit hit the uh, uh, dandelion button. <laughs> Send it everywhere. Yeah. Well, and, and you know another place to put like a big secret or whatever it is is like just a few miles underground on Earth. Well, like, oh, oh, to be discovered at at some uh, far away time or yeah, like we still don't have really good tech for digging very deep. Oh man, so. if only somebody was working on on uh, <laughs> drilling holes in the ground. On, yeah, tunnels. Yeah. <laughs> So I just sent a link to just touch us back before. This is the uh, Aztec Tower of Skulls. They discovered a, 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 a new section of this 15th century structure. So. Uh, oh, good God. Wow. It was, it was known as the Huey Tezampa Pantinli. Yeah, maybe they all, now, they're all I, old people who, well, nope, they all have teeth. Um, hmm. Well, you know, uh, uh, we, Ashley and I, when we were in Rome, went to go see the Capuchin Crypts, uh, which was a, a, a monastic sect that built gigantic, uh, very reverential, whenever one of their order died, they would take every bone out of their body and build these, like, beautiful but haunting and macabre uh, 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 you know, religious, uh, uh, iconography. It, it, it was, uh, basically, uh, body worlds before body worlds. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, Corey, if we can find, uh, uh, some pictures of it, the, the Capuchin crypts in, in Rome, uh, but 
these all died violently. <laughs> yeah. So that was not the same as the Capuchin Crips. Like there are there are elements of of uh, people doing this in in a reverential way to honor the dead. I don't think that uh, I, I agree with you, Brian. That if they all had if they all had uh, a, a fairly healthy teeth that are preserved, then yeah, you could probably think that those heads were probably severed without their permission. Well, oh, wow. some people are like, well, maybe there were their warriors that were like, it's, it's like if we went to Arlington Cemetery yeah. and you started digging up bodies, like, oh, they shot Ali, but like, eh, there's, there's, there, there were other. It wasn't just Europeans documenting this. Yeah, yeah. So, th- so these are the Capucha Crips that we're looking at now on the video feed. Uh, uh, this was done before Rome had laws about uh, uh, fiddling around with human remains, and this was grandfathered in. But if there is, if at any moment a piece of bone hits the ground from its original securing, they have to bury it. Like uh, it cannot wow. go back yeah. up to, to be because, part because of it. Because now it's the trolley problem where it's like, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That looks like you're actively going to kill two people to save five. Uh we're just gonna. I mean, it's already there. We it's, can't. We it's can't there, take it down. But now, as soon as a bone hits the ground, it's now illegal, and they need to bury it respectfully. Uh, they they, they yeah. cannot. They cannot re, re replace it there. It's yeah. Uh, you know, and to the subject of people go like, well, are we being too harsh on this culture? It's like, well, we can go to a place called Auschwitz, and we can see what one group does to another group. Yeah, and then we can go, you know, look at look at things we literally did to indigenous people out of you know the idea of conquest. But, uh, and- re- yeah, real quick shout out. Uh, we've talked about it. Uh, I think it's been the uh, two years uh, maximum or minimum before we can mention better, better angels of our nature again uh, by Stephen Pinker, mm-hmm. where it's like that opening chapter. Uh, by the way, if you're unfamiliar with the book, it's basically about how we are the most peaceful we've ever been uh, in terms of violent deaths per capita in in all of human history, even including 20th century and so on. But but to make a point uh, uh, at a very gut level, you spend the entire first chapter finding out what people in the Middle Ages did for fun. Uh, you get to learn what breaking on the wheel is and, and where... Uh, uh, ways to skin a cat comes from, and yeah. <laughs> like, like, oh my gosh, man! It, it turns out uh, inventing cable, great idea. <laughs> like inventing radio, great idea. Like because when you don't have Fibber McGee and Molly, you get into some weird places real fast. Oh boy! <laughs> so another uh, thing I want to bring up is a so this is Andrew kind of sighing because it's like. Like everybody's sort of nuts on this. There are some researchers that have put forth, you know, when we've been looking at these images stuff on Mars, like the Martian blueberries, which are, uh, we think it's like hematite. We think it's, you know, like a metallic material. And there's a research paper that got published by a group of people that some of the people involved have very, uh, fanciful theories on other stuff okay and some people and for some people that's a reason to just say like ah this again from these people it's like well you know let me tell you about an alchemist who is into astrology who also happened to be named sir isaac newton yeah like, let's find, you know, <laughs> you know, we'd love like, to watch like, like, counterfeiters get hanged that's another fun <laughs> fact about oh, that yeah. weirdo <laughs> yeah really yeah, yeah. like that's how he spent sunday afternoons he was like i hate counterfeiters oh they're hanging one mm. <laughs> <laughs> he was by all accounts a jerk he was a, jerk. <laughs> a brilliant but a jerk uh they're not where's a that people... biopic <laughs> <laughs> there's a total unrepentant dick weirdo <laughs> like oh by the way he, he was Isaac also Newton. uh am i remembering this right andrew i think he was obsessed with his mother and uh uh man he, he was very had a lot going on yeah uh so this paper got put out about like, uh, you know, these, it's a bunch of different, I'm going to see if I can find the title of the paper. Cause I got like, great photos. It looks, you're like, Oh wow, this is very interesting. Um, and it's, where did I put my notes here? Uh, the paper is fungi and Mars evidence of growth and behavior from sequential images. Okay. And a uh, number of researchers from different institutions worked on this paper and there's a bunch of, let me see if I can send this to Corey. So if he wants to pull up the images, cause better than me trying to explain it, 
And then we need to get full context. But the thing I want is the frustrating thing is that like there's an article on CNET which says, no, NASA photos are not evidence of fungus growing on Mars. Sorry. I'm like, okay, cool. Three quarters of this is debunking, is criticizing the person and the people who did this and say not this again kind of thing. And then we get one, uh, we basically get four paragraphs of people saying, no, nope, this isn't what this is. And, and it's like, all right, let's. let's well, I, I think those are just, uh, uh, there needs to be a reckoning in terms of science journalism. And and there's probably it's a spinoff of just a larger journalism conversation that we kind of need to have. Uh, but specifically, I feel like through this last year, when we've had such piss poor uh, a science communication at a time where science communication was very important and very vital and very tricky and complicated to get right. Uh, you know, just even reading that headline immediately makes me flash back to the article uh, that I believe almost exactly had no you didn't get coronavirus in the fall of 2019 because that was something that was kind of going around after it uh, uh, picked up because a lot of people, including my wife, got like really, really, really mm. bad respiratory focused flus. Uh, and uh, uh, as it turns out, yes, yes, many people did. Indeed, that yeah. is, is exactly what happened, but we rushed to kind of like poo poo it and and not to say that their reasoning at the time was not sound and criticisms that you made of the person that was bringing it up were not something to be heard but it's just that declarative idea that is like just uh, i think out now damage it well as hey uh, dummy in, in, yeah. hey dummy you're dumb to believe this well and in fact like it was it was last night on the drive back uh from uh my uh, the grandparents place uh, you know, my, my daughter's 17. She's getting ready to go to college and stuff. And I forget what the, uh, how we got there, but there's a question about like, um, oh, uh, I think at some point peop uh, somebody was asking how effective masks are or whatever. Yeah. And it's like, uh, Bonnie was just sharing that that was a topic that was being discussed uh, at, at the get together. And uh, uh, my daughter uh, like, like cut her off saying, uh, masks are super important. They're great. And, and anyone who thinks otherwise is dumb and I hate dumb people and whatever. And then, and, and I reminded her that, well, sweetheart, the centers for disease control, um, just one year and two months ago today was pleading for people to not use masks, yeah. stating unequivocally that it would not help. And they would, they, they were too important. They save them for the doctors. You really don't need a mask. And it's like, so, so, uh, that's not to say whether it's right or whether it's wrong, but it is to say that when somebody is wrong, you should be kind because I have been and plan to be wrong a lot in my life and, and or, or confused and wrong as, is I think what I said. Um, and so, uh, but, but, but that moment with my 17 year old daughter, uh, tracks a hundred percent with what you're with the way science is being I, reported I, I nowadays. Just, yeah. I just think, uh, uh, that level of stridency. I would expect oh, from a seventeen-year-old so, girl, but not from, <laughs> from, from journalists. Maybe we should maybe <laughs> we should have a little bit more editorial control <laughs> when it comes to how we're communicating our scientific messages. Last section of this article is bad science. One of the bigger problems I'm publishing about Joseph's claim is allowing bad science to make its way to the public, and then they quote, they quote, you know, some rando on Twitter just found out there's life on Mars via effing Utilad. Um, and then it's like this pandemic has shown us misinformation can be harmful, eroding confidence in science and researchers and institutes. Yeah, researchers and institutes uh, lying to us and making things up because of our pet's interest really does a lot of erosion, too, you think? And so um, I'm not saying I like this whole article, like it's probably all BS. Like I'm it's sketchy as, as heck a lot of stuff there, but I think that's not the way you debunk a thing. I, well, it's I, not I, the way I, you do I it. agree. I think that there's an unnecessarily adversarial tone. And and if I if we really wanted to Them clicks get, though. Yeah, I mean that's the thing, is that if we really wanted to get into the the uh, uh journalistic world of why that happened and where that evolved from. A lot of it was from the era of kind of the aughts blogs where uh, you had, even in a pre-social media world, big garish headlines that would never run in a newspaper 
And now not only are the newspapers further eroded, but the blogs are also going belly up. And yet that, for whatever reason, is the only thing that remains, despite the fact that it's like, you know, we're also now seeing a rise in more substantive places like like Substack and stuff like that, where people are are craving very like uh, a more straight ahead uh, content that doesn't necessarily screech or have uh, the same level of ideology. Uh, not to take us too far, of course, but I think I heard uh, our friend Andrew Heaton saying that, um, and and maybe he was quoting someone else. Maybe he was, uh, uh, it's his thought, but uh, uh, it's not that, that we're more divided than ever. It's that we're better sorted than ever. And so as a result, we only want to hear declarative titles like yeah. that. That's part of the reason uh, journalistic institutions like the New York times or whatever have figured out like, Oh wait, you know, we can, um, uh, uh, everybody used to sell ads, but then, but then that stopped working. And so rather than talk to everyone, it became easier to just put up a paywall and say, Hey man, on the inside, all the things you already believe it's a magical wonderland. We're going to tell you you're right about everything with yeah. big fat declarations across the board. Yeah. And it's, I guess, my frustration kind of comes through is is that uh, if you can, I don't know, Corey, if you can pull up, there's a, there's image in there that's cool. They're like compelling where you see, you know, like, oh, there's like, there's, there's, there's scattered here and there's more of these little nodules here. And then, and then, you know, the people married in the paper can make the claim like, oh, these things are growing. And it could be, you know, could be any number of things. It could be things like this is the image in particular. We're looking at like, oh, there's more there. And, it's cool. I would love to know what's going on here. Like, I'm it, not like, oh, it's life. But the fact that we get an article is, oh, there's just BS and nobody's going through the images and telling us what's going on. Well, and and you know, you know what it reminds me of is, uh, I don't know if there's any version of it that still exists, but there used to be a magazine called the 40 and Times that mm, was loved it. nothing <laughs> but just collecting weird stuff. And, and, um, depending on how you squinted, they were either actively promoting pseudoscience or, they were just collecting weird stuff. Like, you know, they happen to snap an image of, uh, of, of, of a smoke plume and it looks like the devil's face is in it or whatever, yeah. you know, <laughs> it was, uh, it, it was great. And, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if going, you know, if eventually some AI robot is going to have the patience to go through all of that and say, Hey, that thing that you just discovered last week, here's the 40 and times calling it right in, in 1922 or whatever. Well, we had, you know, and that's a, you know, you know, we'll, we'll, let's make it very clear. 14 times is BS, but it was fun BS to read. But remember, you know, uh, Thomas Jefferson on the idea of meteors, you know, I says, I, I, I'd sooner believe that, you know, like these, some Yankees or whatever, were making this story up than things are falling from the sky. Cause it was just this <laughs> idea of that this could happen. And I don't, and here it's not like re, scientists are putting stuff on Mars because we're looking for life. And this isn't yeah. like, oh, they're trying to keep it a secret. That's not the problem here because it's, they're not. It's it's the problem here is this people who think they're scientific, you know, science editors and science writers who think they're promulgating science who are not. They're they're it's they're nah, this is BS. It's like, no, that's not science. Science is like that eh, doesn't evidence doesn't support this. We show these photos to three people, hear their opinions on this, not like, man, let me lecture you, you know, because if you dummies who didn't listen, it's like Ugh. Science should just be like a, and I don't, I don't want to get into like the actual quirks of the character, but something along the lines of like data from Star Trek that like has no judgment. It is just there to talk forever yeah. about a thing. <laughs> like, it's just like, like, well, while highly unlikely, uh, uh, what, what we might imagine is this is possible and and this is blah 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 like that's the point the point of science is that it should just be a constant there should you should never be able to stump science it will always be looking uh you know what uh <laughs> i would love a filter for your uh the browser of your choice that uh takes every science headline and just adds the words we think at the beginning and then a comma and then says but we'll see <laughs> Like, yeah. like yeah. then it's and like, we think you're wrong about having gotten COVID in 2019, yeah. but, but we'll, we'll see. see. Yeah. 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 And that's, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. and I guess part of this, like science, like, I'm oh, sorry. No, it, it's just, it's just part of this again, gets into a, a journalism conversation of like, well, how much, how important is a headline? How important is a lead? How important are both of those things compared to the rest of the article? How, how substantive uh, uh, does it need to be like there was a, a a New York Times article not to get back to COVID 
but uh, was about uh, uh, herd immunity and whether or not we were going to hit herd immunity. And, or whether and, it's possible. or Yeah, stuff like that. And it's like, the article wasn't bad. The headline was, in my opinion, unnecessarily scaremongery and uh, uh, I think actively making an average reader dumber if you do not follow you know a lot of the the, the COVID-19 stuff uh, but it's like what is that worth is it a good article because if you read it like there is a lot of good information in there there is a lot of good advancing the football on what people estimate a herd immunity could be whether or not it actually matters uh, uh, you know uh, what the government's response to is or is it damned out of the box because the headline sucks well and and is isn't it a thing uh, 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 enlighten me on this i i had the impression that part of working at a uh, any kind of publication was that you got to write the article but it was your editor that got to pick the title and then nowadays they change the title after the fact constantly a b testing to see what's working yeah no i mean in in general the workflow is you are assigned an article by your assignment editor if you don't bring it in, and that's rarer. Uh, you write the article, and then that's your end as a writer. You then hand it, you work with your uh, section editor, then it goes off to the copy desk, and at that point, unless you get a call back on like you know from somebody higher up to be like, hey, we need to flesh this out, or we need another source there, or we need to know where you're coming from, then you're done. And then from that point, it is your editor that puts the headline on uh, and, and, and whatever designers, because there is, it's less of a problem now in an internet age, but certainly in, in the world of newspapers, you know, back when I, I took the telegraph to work, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, there, there was, you know, X amount of, of account. And that was, you know, something that might shift late into the night as the, as the paper was laid out and had to be, you know, put in there. So there was a practical reason to do it beyond just saying like, I'm the evil editor. I do what I want. I don't care about your article. Uh, but now I think that there's less of an excuse for that because we should be getting better headlines. We should be like, there should be an onus put on that more in my opinion. Well, they're there, but it, as Brian pointed, they're optimizing them for clicks though. That's what's happened yeah. is that, is that, is that, is that it's that wall. What used to be probably a poorly framed wall, but was like the Chinese wall between, you know, what was, you know the, the the news gathering and you know side and editorial side and advertising yeah that is gone that is really gone and not in ways that are necessarily obvious even to the people working there but you know you you go from working for new york times writing about science policy to working for pfizer to helping them you know pivot how they're going to do their next drug release then you go back to working for some news organization and you see this in reportage now and Part of the problem, too, is reporters, you know, we treat science like it's an institution, like it's, yeah. well, I need to know what's going on with the military. Call the Pentagon. I need to know what's going on with this this bill that's being passed. Well, call our contact at the House of Representatives. Cool. <laughs> I need to know what's going on with these photos. Call this. Call science at the university, the contact you have. Yeah. Well, I spoke to science, and science told me this, and it's like. Well, there was there was science. a there was an exceptionally stupid article that uh, uh, was was political in nature, but it was about a a certain I'm not going to name him, but a certain ex president and whether or not uh, uh, this 45th president of the United <laughs> States, I'm not going to name him, uh, was going to face legal. Uh, no, it was like like what his legal strategy would be. And literally the entire sourcing of the article was calling law professors. And it was like legal experts suggest that should this. 45th president of the United States face charges. He which, might. This is what he would do. And it's like, what fan fiction? Like, and, and, that, and that gets to our kind of cult of experts where, where we we're like, Oh, like uh, we need to know science is, is herd immunity real? Let's call science. 1-800-SCIENCE. And it, and, it dials, and it dials up Johns Hopkins and somebody picks up the phone and says, science here. Is herd immunity real? Indeed it is. Click. <laughs> Professor Science of I, Johns Hopkins University says. I, and I'm going to tell you a little thing that I've learned in, in my years. The more gifted and better communicator somebody is, it means the more time they spent communicating and perhaps the less time they spent in the laboratory. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, there, so, there so, are exceptions. 
Uh, one of the things before we move on from, from titles versus articles or whatever, uh, and this is the marketer in me, uh, coming out where, um, you know, we, when we send out an email blast for a new product or whatever, we make sure to pick a subject line that we think will get opened because, uh, MailChimp likes it when people, when, you know, that's how it knows what spam and, and what yeah. content or whatever. Uh, but there, there are often times where the click rate to open an email is very, very poor, but then we'll sell a whole lot of them. And, and it took me a while to figure out like, Oh, uh, if, if, if they know they want it, uh, then why would they click on the email? They'll just like, Oh, they've got hats now I'll buy a hat. And so, and yeah. so likewise, these clickbaity titles are really problematic because uh, the content may be nuanced and accurate and well-researched or whatever, but I am astonished at how much of my view of the world I get just by opening up Google News and uh, I, whether or not I click on one dang thing, I see all the trending stories and now my my brain is now filled with with essentially uh, clickbaity tweets yeah. from news organizations that that almost certainly are skewing my perception of what's happening in the world. And that's and that's where, where, where I got upset about that New York Times article was not because I even read it or I even saw the headline. It was because the headline was generating such sturm and drung on Twitter because it was reinforcing this narrative that like we're all doomed and everything's bad and things are terrible when it's like, in reality, America is doing among the best in the world on the vaccines. Yes, we could continue to do better. Yes, we could continue to educate. Uh, uh, I don't think that doctors should be on Jimmy Kimmel yelling at people, but, uh, uh, you know, to each their own in terms of medical communication. Uh, still, like, we are, this is good news. We are doing good. And yet, to read that headline and then to read, it, it reinforces, I think, actively negative parts of our society that are just, like, pessimistic on a level that I think, hurts us. I think it hurts our safety. I think it is, it is, that is a life and death thing. There is, there is a book on marketing to be written about how headline and subject messages are the content. And like when I write, yeah. when I send out email now, I'm like, what do I want them to know? New book, title of new book available now. That's, that's what I want them to read. Even if they never click, like they can't unknow that they've now read yeah. your tweet and, and you got them. Also, uh, a tip of the hat to the chat room. I, I missed who it was, but but I almost burst out laughing because we're talking about journalism and headlines and editors. And somebody in the chat says, I thought editors just wanted more pictures of Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> it's still true that it's day, I mean, look, that's, uh, like uh, back in the day, the further, you but know. I mean, just give me more pictures the of fur Spider-Man. The, the further we stray from know. God's light. <laughs> Everything SMH. you need to know, you could learn from Daily Bugle operations. Oh, you know, yeah. God. What does Jonas Jane, Jonah want? What's the the harried life of a reporter and trying? I need photos of this. I need it doesn't bleed, it won't lead. You know, all of this, it's all there. <laughs> Whereas, like that, that was a problem. The DC universe and like Clark Kent, like he sounded like he was a horrible reporter. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, and, and, and actually, having just rewatched the Donner uh, Supermans, um, like. I don't know why they made it a bit, but uh, but Lois Lane, every scene she's in, she's like, are there two T's in little or one? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like that. <laughs> like, That's because you know she's... Her her skill was she was a great reporter because she went out there and got the news. She couldn't spell worth anything. <laughs> Clark yeah. was Clark would be perfectly margined to all this sort of stuff. But you also think, like, he could have been the greatest reporter in the world, but he just wouldn't use his powers. You yeah. know, like because he's got super hearing and all this sort of stuff. Oh, what he's if what crap. if he took his like what if he goes to a therapist and the therapist is like, you need to take your day job a little more seriously. And so he just goes around X-ray visioning and he's just like secret government installation yeah. at these coordinates. <laughs> <laughs> he could have could have exposed everybody. Man, which, he could have uh, gotten he could have gotten all the pictures of Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah. Uh one last quick story. I want you to imagine that you're a Japanese coastal town. You're mm -hmm. suffering some economic hardship before COVID and now with COVID. Mm -hmm. We've given you about the equivalent of $250,000 in funding. What do you do? I actually know this story. So, Brian, this is all on you. Hold on. Give, give, give me this, uh, the, the setup again. You're, you're a little town in Japan, a yep. little coastal town in Japan. Yep. You've been having some you know, economic struggles and COVID's made it worse. Yep. And the government says, here is 
to help your town. I want to believe it's you, you build uh, the top half of a Gojira um, looking like it's coming out of the ocean as a monument <laughs> to make it look like it's approaching your town. So you would build a statue. Yes. A bizarre statue. A bizarre statue, but yeah, we're a kraken or of the with your COVID relief money. Um I mean, that's what I would do, but that's why I ain't mayor of, of a town in Japan. Uh, oh, hold on. Are are you? Uh Mr. Brian, sir. How would you like to be mayor of our town? <laughs> 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 No way! <laughs> when you play for comedy and you get it right, oh my god! <laughs> what, what is it? This is. Uh, let me put it this way: people are like, "Oh, look at how silly this is." Go through our latest, uh, our latest federal budget, our, our latest, you know, relief package. Go look through there and see some of the the darlings there that we will never see the light of that go to benefit people who are you know friendly with the people who wrote the bill. And then tell me this is dumb. Oh, that's amazing. So uh, uh, I don't know if uh, uh, the, the way that I heard the story was that it was a portion of their of, of their yeah, money. They got like eight hundred million won. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. They they they, yeah. they spent the vast majority on it on stuff like that. But one of the things that really really got hit was tourism, and so they decided to put in a gigantic squid statue. Uh, that is uh, uh, now hopefully for them going to bring in more tourists. And I'll tell you what, I was like kind of uh, ready to make fun of it. But then I'm like, you know, whenever my friends go anywhere, the first thing they go to is the thing they can take an Instagram photo in front of. And yep, you could yep. probably do worse than just setting up gigantic Instagram bait in, in your town, in your tourist town. We're, we're literally funding museums. Like we're giving COVID relief money to museums and stuff like this, which debatable whether you're not saying a pro or con against it. Sure. To then go, oh, well, this giant squid. <laughs> well, well, and, and, and yeah. it is a fact, um, uh, and again, not to place a value judgment, but it is definitely a fact that very, 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 two more varies little of, of the trillions of dollars of COVID relief is going to anything directly related to COVID. The, the, the way these things move fast is they were already written and prepared not for COVID. And yeah. then they just say like, well, now uh, uh, let's shrug and say economic stimulus. Am I right? And then, and then they go uh, and, and I'm sure some of it is good. Some of the, some of the, you know, a lot of it is wasteful, I'm sure. Um, but, but uh, some of it might even be COVID related, but, uh, but we, I don't think this is a, a Japanese only weirdo phenomenon no, no, because no, we're, no, we're no, much no, bigger no, weirdos. No, 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 no. Oh, I think yeah. they will see a return on this. Uh, I, I do. I, I think they'll make more than seven three point three million dollars. It's not a bad bet. Well, yeah, no, no, no. That that was their whole COVID thing. This was this was two hundred and twenty eight thousand that they spent on on the big old squid. What? I, well, that's definitely going to get a return on investment. That was actually maybe the best investment they made. Brian's Brian needs. He's like, wait, hold on, yeah. is, that, is that the going rate? Can we uh, get a big old squid here? Uh, hold yeah, on, hold that's... on. It's me, mayor of the small Japanese town. Let me call my cousin, elder brother man, <laughs> <laughs> and get a little bit of advice. <laughs> yeah, that that two hundred thirty eight thousand twenty eight thousand. Like that's like one third of one pay toilet in Manhattan now. Or exactly. Public toilet in Manhattan. Like yeah. that's like. They got a good deal. These uh, people got a good deal. Dude, I'll tell you what. At, uh, like at those numbers, I'm wondering what the HOA says about the squid statues. <laughs> like, <laughs> whether, the, town, the town did it. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Brian's talking about the Texas HOA. So he can put <laughs> I mean, one on at my house. Yard. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's awesome. It's indigenous. I found it here. You can't move it. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, picks? Uh yeah, dude, I saw the new Lord and Miller, newish uh, Lord and Miller on Netflix, uh, The Mitchells versus the Machines, Chef's Kiss, man, so good from beginning to end, pacing's amazing, uh, over the top, tar uh, st uh, over the top storytelling. Uh, I think it, it, it's got strong, cloudy with the chance of meatball vibes. Um, it, if, if these are the guys that did uh, uh, Spider Man into and the, the Spider -verse. Spider Verse, it's it's just great. It's great. It's great. Um, cool. I will keep the train rolling uh, with Lord and Miller uh, just to remind people that the greatest cartoon that ever created was Clone High. Uh, defunct because of their portrayal of Gandhi. 
uh, as a, uh, a party as, bro, as, as a wacky party bro, uh, but uh, uh, brilliant but canceled. I think it's available now on on iTunes. But if if, if you haven't watched it, then I, uh, I just went up and bought it on uh, on Amazon. Yeah, and it, yeah. it was worth it. It's it, I mean, especially now that Lord Miller has not only carved out such a great uh, uh, legacy in in all media, but but cartoons specifically. That was their first cartoon, and it uh, it, it it holds up. Yeah, wish they could do something to Star Wars. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> Sorry, too soon. Release, God, release, uh, release the Lord of Miller cut. Release the Lord of Miller cut. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh my God! Would that be uh, amazing? I will sign up for any streaming service. That's that, the problem. That the problem back. is because uh, that was a thing that was going around after the Snyder cut hit. Yep. Uh, but. There would need to be a acknowledgement of. There would need to be a regime change in in who's making the decision oh, yeah. before any. They even had any level of sense of humor about any bit of that. Um, yeah, but it certainly wouldn't be because Lord Miller haven't immediately. I mean, like that doesn't seem to have hurt their career like at all. Like because they they hit with Spider Verse I mean, right quite, after that. It really was. It's like uh, your loss, world. <laughs> like yeah. I mean. Wouldn't it be wouldn't it be cool if you had a movie made by us? I mean, what if Star Wars was really fun? Just really, <laughs> really fun. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> I have a I have a pick, and I mentioned before that I'd been marking my way through the Hobbit movies. Um, and there's stuff to like in there, there's stuff not. We talked about, you know, the the it's the stretched out and it <sighs> you know, you watch the behind the scenes. Peter Jackson was given this very, very impossible sort of task because it just the, the negotiations to get the rights took forever. And Guillermo del Toro had to back out. And then Peter Jackson gets this like, hey, you've got to go make this movie in five months. And then they're all like thankful that Peter Jackson got ill for a month and couldn't shoot because they're all like all the group of like, oh, we were pressed for time. And thankfully, Peter got sick. So we had, you know, a month, an extra month to get stuff ready. Jesus. Uh, it was just, they're all like, oh, it's bad, but, you know, we needed that month, you know, <laughs> like, well, thanks, Peter. So anyhow, they uh, they go into some, the technical stuff behind there is fascinating. And and you, they made choices, like, there are choices made that I don't know. Like, they talk about how, like, Azrog, like, the big orc villain throughout the thing, they had, they went through so many different concepts for it. They shot with an actor in a specific makeup design and all this and after that, six weeks before the movie is to be delivered, Peter Jackson's like, nah, I don't like it. Let's go redo it. And they completely created a new CGI face and new actor to go do this performance for it, which I think might be a little bit too Kubrickian of like, because the other design I saw looked amazing. And I think the, the final one looked like a mouse. Yeah. But um, they show some technical stuff there. And one of the things they showed was in trying to do the Hobbit, they wanted to do in 3D, not post-process 3D, but actually the two, you know, two cameras, you know, ocular distance apart. And when you're trying to shoot scenes with Gandalf and the dwarves, traditionally the, well, the way they did it in Lord of the Rings, they did force perspective. You know, they put Ian McKellen closer, they put, you know, you know, Frodo further back, and then the camera would line up and it looked like, you know, just Gandalf was bigger. When you're doing 3D, you can't do that because you see the trick. You see that yeah. this actor is just standing closer. So they show this thing. One of the first things they shot, which was at bag end. And the way they did it was they built their, had their bag end set. So the dwarves and sort of Bilbo could walk around in. Then they had a green screen version of that set, like basically doors and stuff, but all green. That was 25% larger. Okay. Or 25% smaller, basically. So, got it. you know, Ian McKellen would appear 25% larger. Yeah. So they put Ian McKellen there. They had the dwarves in the other, the real set, and they had two cameras that were synced together. And uh, this documentary is old, so they use the idea, they use the term slaved together. <laughs> so when you move this camera in and this camera, the other camera would move around and they would follow, but it would adjust it by like 25%. Oh, so wow. the Ian McKellen be 25% larger and you do this. And it's an amazing technical achievement, amazing technical achievement to do garbage 3D. That's <laughs> the point. Well, especially at high frame no, rate. So so you, you yeah. very clearly see how garbage it is. Yeah, and guess two things. Nobody ever watches watch that again after the theatrical release. Yeah. You know, 
high well, frame rate or 3D. That must have been weird for Peter Jackson because he'd be like, why don't they like that? That That is exactly how they looked on set. Isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah that's the problem well, is that's exactly how they look on set. It looked like a Mexican telenovela. Yeah. Um, and then the thing is, is it's amazing, but then there's a scene there. And I, I implore anybody who's interested in the intersection of technology and art to watch where Ian McKellen is in the set by himself sitting at a table on the point of tears because he has nobody to act off of. He's got an earpiece and he can hear them, but he's trying to look around this green space and there's nobody there. And this actor who spent his lifetime, you know, wanting to be about performance and working in the theater. And you put this guy who's, you know, 72 at this point, you put him in this other room, like, okay, great act. Yeah. And it's, it's, he's just emotionally wrought and they had to go talk. Oh, we had to make him feel better and do this, blah, blah, blah. But like, man, there's performance is a real thing. Performance is a real thing. And I think that that's where, like, when you hear the actors rave about the, 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 the tech that they had for the Mandalorian and, and what they're doing now, like it really just gives people that ability to at least have some frame of reference of what world they're in and, and, well, it, and how it, it they're tees them up for success. I mean, yeah, it, yeah. It, it gets the most like, out of, out of your instruments. After two and a half decades of uh, actors looking at tennis balls and pretending that it's their dead best friend, uh, uh, you know, now they were able to kind of uh, uh, interact with things on, on a more realistic level. Yeah. So it's worth it's totally worth watching for behind the scenes on that. I mean, it's the, the best behind the scenes ever was the original Lord of the Rings ones were because you're just that journey of making the movie was just as emotional as the movie itself. Well, and, and, and what an extraordinary leap at the time it was. I mean, nothing, yeah. no precedent for for what they were achieving. And also, like from the point of view, too, is that I think the team that when they made The Hobbit was they wanted they were connected to it, but it was kind of a business. Well, let, we've got this business. Let's continue the business yeah. and make the business of this where Lord of the Rings was, we love this thing and we want to make the most amazing thing we can. Let's get some people together. And it's obviously a business, but the blood, sweat and tears was about trying well, to tell and, a great and, story. And there had to be, have been a sense of with Lord of the Rings, uh, that was not president of the Hobbit of, of, of let's try to jump up and punch the moon. Let's do something that, that nobody's ever been able to pull off. Yeah. Yeah. Corey. Yes. Mine is Brandon Sanderson. Oh, man. Yeah. I told you I was going to get started, didn't I? Know. I? Uh, yes, mm. yes, you did. Uh, Stormlight series uh, from Brandon Sanderson. Uh, some of the best books, uh, in my opinion, ever. I uh, love uh, his Brandon story Sanderson, we, uh, previously I read The Mistborn, and, and, yep. and you got my goat. Like, yep. like you're right. It's, it's good stuff. And I hear that this is the, uh, the, the bigger, stronger, older brother. Yes, Yes, uh, it's it's a larger world, um, still magic systems like Brandon Sanderson always does, but just even better storytelling. It's just amazing. I, st I still love Mistborn. They're they're really close together on which one of my favorites would be, but uh, just such a good series. Uh, Andrew, have you read any of those? I I've not. I met Sanderson, and he's one of these writers that's like. I think 30 years from now, 40 years from now, when we look at like who are sort of the masters of fantasy and genre around this time period, you're going to hear him and George R. R. Martin, maybe a couple others, but Sanderson's just the reviews just consistently knocks it out of the park. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's Mistborn, well, it, 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 which is not the series you're talking about, the one I read, mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 it did a good job of tricking me, started off feeling like some young adult stuff. And then by the end, you're like, nope. holy cow, this is epic. <laughs> yep. yep. Yeah, his worlds always start really small, like a kid on a farm, right? Just a tiniest, Name tiniest Name one world. other story that begins with a kid and on then, a farm. Yeah, right? <laughs> and then it just gets massive. I mean, talking about worlds and gods and everything by the end, it's just crazy. What one uh, would you say to start with? Um. Uh. Well, it depends on if you want a crazy amount of time. Um, so I would say if, you, if you're okay with longer reads, like we're talking 60-hour audio books, you know, 50s and 60s, then a Stormlight series is where I would start. Um, if you want a uh, slightly shorter, then I think Mistborn. Uh, Mistborn has maybe more fun characters, um, and Stormlight probably has the better story. So if you're more character-driven, maybe uh, maybe I'd start with... Uh, uh, Miss Bourne. Miss Bourne, yeah, thank yeah. you. 
All right, cool. I'm uh, putting some of this. I, I'll see how long it'll take when I get to them. But um, yeah, I mean, this is like you're looking looking at Final Final Empire, uh, which is the first one of the Mistborn. And this is a book that has uh, 65, 4.8 stars, 65,000 ratings. Yeah, dude, it's, it's, it's good. It's a, uh, it's real good. Every, every, I mean, uh, what's funny is I, I do the same thing. I seek that kind of validation, and uh, uh, luckily, I went in blind to Mitchell's versus the machines, and I was like, I think this is one of those that everyone will agree is good. I open up Rotten Tomatoes; it's ninety eight percent. It's like, yep, pretty good. Yeah, yeah, and I, I sometimes I'll pick things up and they just don't work for me, and I know. I'm the problem. Yeah. <laughs> I know I'm the problem. But I know. Do, 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 do. It's, it's my, my own, own damn fault. I look to the stream. <laughs> Gentlemen, it's been weird. <laughs> uh, hey, so, since we're wrapped up but still on the air, and because I did it on the air, uh, uh, I apologize so sincerely, Andrew, for just dropping the emotional bomb on you. No, uh, no, uh, Brian. It's... A- what? I like notice how I immediately turned it on you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thanks for dropping your tragedy on me, bro. <laughs> well, no, thanks, well, bro. Well, so, so what's funny is um, uh, I, I only give the two minute summary of it, but um, but we had just a one. It, it, I think for whatever reason, I grew my hair out to hold on to things, and and then uh, I was only willing to take a half step, and so I did the ha ha, it's a mullet thing, you know. And uh, and then just uh, we had Mother's Day, and I was like, yeah, I think it's time. And so it was like this emotional thing to let go of it. Now, granted, it was a nine dollar haircut, and and I'm not I'm not entirely thrilled with the results. And but what was funny was during the day I had that moment. I'm like, yeah, it's time to let this go. And Bonnie playfully. She had never done this before, but uh, but the mullet was in a ponytail. She went back. Uh, she just was walking by and just went to my ponytail, and and I was just like, oh, this thing has to go right now. <laughs> it's like, and and, <laughs> and 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 body was like, did I do something wrong? I was like, no, no, no. It's like wearing a loud checkered shirt and then realizing midway through the party that, oh, I got to get this off immediately. And then just after that, somebody says, whoa, play chess much? <laughs> and it's like, yeah. it's it. It's a small thing, but it was a a wrongly timed moment with the did it. Yeah, <laughs> and so, yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I should have been better prepared for 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 uh, assistant pen- principal ribbing, and I apologize that I didn't have the oh, no, the. No, I, I, I was good. not in the right space to to. to it looks good. It, looks <laughs> it does. I know. I know. It no, does, no, no, it does look I, good. Yeah. I, 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 I do, but but it's just I, like I just. I've been cutting my own hair for a year, Brian. I've been cutting my own hair for a year. No, okay? I, I I just I just I I, I should have been better uh, uh, prepared. I live for... in a van down by the river. I cut my own hair. <laughs> uh, well, cool. Here, uh, I'll, I'll run to the restroom and grab a soda. We'll do after things. Yep. Cool. Yep. Cool. Um. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Do, 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 do. Corey, what's up, buddy? Hey. 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 Man, we just had the best barbecue. You and Mitsula yeah. have been barbecue bros we uh, and will continue to be until he leaves at the end of the week. Uh, but but you guys have been on a, a, a barnstorming barbecue tour. Yes. And that's it. we're just getting started, baby. <laughs> we're going again the, tonight. Tonight, too. <laughs> yeah. You're oh, double yeah. dipping. Oh, yeah. We double dip every day, man. <laughs> I'm so excited to have a uh, barbecue partner here in town. Oh, me. my God. We were joking about how uh, I didn't I didn't realize how much Corey and Mitsula, uh, uh, two of my favorite people separately, like <laughs> literally just are so similar in so many different ways to the point where this morning uh, 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 Mitsula's out on the porch and uh, wearing a, a hat face front ways. Mm-hmm. And a T-shirt, and Corey comes out, and I will just say for comedic effect, in like a a a a, a, a color uh, a, a coordinated uh, you know maybe like the opposite version yep. mm-hmm. T-shirt with a hat backwards, <laughs> and I'm just like yep. they both have beards, and they're both like, oh, what's the barbecue today? Cool, like <laughs> finishing each other's sentences, mm-hmm. speaking in unison, like they are the, the country mouse and city mouse version of each other, and and it is my to my great delight. Yes. Yeah, no, buddy. We went for a hour and ten minute drive for some barbecue right before weird things. And you guys got a a, a, a barbecue pork chop. Yeah, 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 yeah. So a few of the places will actually do smoked pork chops, which are 
super risky and super hard to do because it'll get so dry and terrible. Yeah. And gosh, it was just so good. Just soap melt in your mouth. <sighs> cool. Mm. So what's on what, what's on the menu tonight then? I don't know. I got to figure that out. We have several options, and it kind of depends because he has to be back for the uh, uh, whatever hockey game that is. Oh right. yeah, big uh, big big Golden Knights Avalanche Correct. game tonight. Yeah, so it'll be to, a, to, to decide the West. It'll be a closer trip. Um, this one. So we even have like a little local place here called the Slab that has really good sandwiches. That we've yep. been they they close at like eight o'clock, so we've had a hard time getting over there. Gotcha. So maybe, maybe we do that. If not, maybe we'll drive. I'm down. on a plane right now, Corey. <laughs> yeah. I'm on a ask Justin about me dragging him to barbecue places on lecture tours. Oh, oh man, dude, yeah, no, that was that was our move. Is uh, we would uh, uh, chart out the lecture tour and then chart out the barbecue places that we would get, and then just fart up the rental uh, as we're driving to the next uh, uh the next uh, uh city for the for, for, for the lecture tour yeah I, I have to count but remember the cat the, the thing that was like the little hole in the wall with the school cafeteria table encounter oh dude and that was in texas too that i, I forget yeah i forget where that was in between i feel like we were leaving austin and maybe going to san antonio yeah and and uh, uh we stopped in uh uh it was just nowheresville like like literally like i i don't even if, know if there was like a sign leading off whatever road we were on but like it was uh yeah it was literally just this old converted cafeteria with with the with the the riveted plastic chairs uh and it was delish it was so good and we're we're driving around and they, like this big buick and everybody like thought we we're like undercover cops or something yeah <laughs> literally people ask are you guys cops like you're, you're like like the what? most low rent version of a uh, true detective. <laughs> they were asking for a picture of me and Mitzi next to each other. Oh yeah. No, no, they're, they're like, it's so funny. They are, they're like, like the bash brothers. Did we just become best friends? They did. It's so funny. They're so great. Oh, here, let me switch the screen. Uh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Oh, it's so good. I just love the fact that you guys wear your hats in different directions so new viewers can tell you apart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so good. Um yeah, barbecue uh is uh you know, it's 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 it it is it is a blessing if you have a barbecue community because there is there's is nothing worse than bad barbecue. Oh yeah. No, for sure. For sure. That was that was always my gig when I was working for Microsoft. I'd take everybody on barbecue adventures. Yeah. They would come to town. Florida's got good. Like we're we're we're, we're Andrew and I are from uh uh there's a couple places that are like legendary. Tom Jenkins. I hope, man, I haven't had the heart to to check if, if Tom Jenkins uh survived COVID, but um just awesome, immaculate, legendary barbecue in in, in South Florida. Uh, and then there were a couple, I think Georgia pigs, another one there, but, uh, in, in general, uh, you know, Florida has, it, it tends to be a little bit more kind of like soul food. You get soul food kind of stuff with it. Uh, so it's, it's not quite just the, like, you know, a, a abattoir, like, you know, like, like meat and like two sides, like, like How you see here. Of, uh, the Cuban influence is there like in the barbecue and the food. Uh, you wind up just seeing more Cuban food like like you don't necessarily like like that barbecue tends to slot more into southern mm -hmm. kind of soul food than it does i mean you see a lot of barbecued food at cuban restaurants yeah but not yeah, pollo tropical would do barbecue ribs and stuff and yeah. oh god yeah yeah, yeah. pollo tropical is is uh man that should go national pollo tropical that actually there was one that actually showed up in fort worth did it. And then it immediately shut down because nobody ate there. <laughs> uh, we got a, a, a topic. Oh, hold on. Let me... uh, even in North Central Florida, we had Cuban. Well, technically, the, the Tampa says they invented the Cuban sandwich, although that is that is of some dispute. So... Um, um, uh, Corey, would you mind scooting that so I can see Andrew's face? Which? Oh, yeah. I'm uh, moving, moving the monster cat there. there you go. Yeah, there we go. Oh, there he is. There we go.
Uh-oh. I don't have a topic. Uh, well, well, here we we can freestyle it. Um, um, should should we speak in the vaguest of no. terms? Okay. No. <laughs> oh, burn. No, we should. Okay. <laughs> we should not. Then we're not going to be able to. But uh, <laughs> what can we freestyle? Uh, we can talk about. Oh, you know what we can talk about? I'm uh, building if, a studio. Yeah. We can and, talk and, about and building a studio. As, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, hey, coincidence, I'm building a studio. Uh, uh, and also, the phone is ringing off the hook with people who suddenly are like, so about uh, doing stuff again. Like, the whole world's just coming back Man, online. I Maybe we could talk about that. It's opening back up. Uh, At least from the people that are calling me trying to book this place. That's well, uh, okay. Well, we, we we can talk about. It well, I think that that might be the better the better focus then is instead of necessarily building things like just to be like like hey, from a business perspective, not only in terms of the content, what moves making, do you make? Like like what yeah. what is what is our line? What is the the world's line? How do you cater to like you don't want to make your viewing audience uncomfortable? You don't want to make your guests uncomfortable? Like because and, and I actually have some some thoughts that I would love to toss to you guys. Cool. Andrew, you good with that? Yep. Cool. Just if good. You, if you are ready, then I will count you in in just one second here. All right, Andrew, in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the After Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello, friends. Mr. Brian Brushwood. Islands in the CTU, too. And our editor extraordinaire today is Mr. Corey. Well, hello. Gentlemen. Yeah. We are, uh, we're making some good progress, vaccinations. I get my second shot on Wednesday. Awesome. I'm looking forward to that. I've, I've booked a walkathon, a workout session, and starting a new, you know, Pilates class for the day after, because I like, feel like it'll be filled with energy. Bunch of uh, charity yeah. work as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's not get crazy. Um, okay. Coughing in old people's mouths. For charity. Yeah. It's a, it's a Competitively <laughs> for charity. Yeah. yeah. That's a, you know, the improv CPR class. So <laughs> things are hopefully, you know, at least I think in the U S we've been really, you know, the, the, the vaccinations have been going great compared yeah. to the rest. It could be better, obviously compared to the rest of the world. Uh, thankfully, once this thing started happening a year ago, a lot of powers that be decided let's let's we got to vaccinate, you know, as well as let's social distancing isn't going to be here. Let's vaccinate and put us ahead of other places in the world that I wish were sort of uh, get there. And we need we got a lot more to go. People, yeah. you know, can't can't bring back the people that died and there's still people that are going to die. And so I don't want to be like, let's not do an Ewok dumb dumb dance right now. Yeah. But no, we can see the light, we think. Yeah, uh, 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 cases are falling, uh, uh, deaths are falling. Uh, the the best, um, you know, silver lining is that even in places that have had spikes post uh, the beginning of our vaccination spree, like uh, what happened in Michigan, uh, we're now kind of seeing even the their deaths go down. And even though their cases spiked fairly high, we saw a marked decrease in the number of deaths that normally would correspond with that. So that is a very good sign. We're seeing very promising things in Israel and the United Kingdom, the question then becomes, all right, if you are vaccinated, that's a personal decision that you have to make of how to reintegrate back into society, uh, what you feel comfortable with, what you, how you feel comfortable doing it. But from perspective of content creators, there's also what you want to do and how you want to uh, model yourself. And the, the, I've been thinking about it recently because I happen to move to a town that is lousy with 50 to 100 seat theaters and venues. Oh, which uh, I'm so glad that there were more words after the word lousy. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, I am desperate to do a live show. I am desperate oh. to have human contact in, in that performance capacity. But I have a question that I would love to throw to, 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 to the two of you guys. Like, is this too soon? Like, if I did one next week, I feel like it would be too soon. But will next month be too soon? Will a month and a half be too soon? Should I do a thing outside 
first and then do a thing inside. How inside is inside? If it's a large beer hall bar and it's not like like a, a tiny little black box theater, is that good? Like, I, I, I don't know. Oh there, there's gosh. a lot of questions. Uh, uh, just thinking of the live event scenario, because the most obvious thing is like, well, just like smoking and non-smoking sections, maybe we'll have a socially distanced and a non-socially distanced sec- section. And it's like, well, does that mean one of them has to be second class citizens compared to the others and the cool kids are smoking and the non cool kids are not smoking. Um, that's a fascinating live event question. And, and how much, how much do you set those rules? Because for me, if I'm being selfish, which a lot of this is me being selfish and just really wanting to be out in front of people. Uh, I, I, I very much want to be like, no, 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 this is for me. This is not for you guys. Yeah. Like, like I, I literally just kind of want to charge enough to get people into the room. Uh, 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 I, I just, I'm vaccinated. So you guys can all cough in each other's mouths after the show for all I care. I literally just need your energy. Yeah. Uh, well, I, 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 as a middle ground, uh, between being alone in a studio and being on stage with a crowded group of people, I, I can vouch for the fact that, you know, we built we built this entire crazy Wonka factory with the intention of, of constantly bringing in uh, people to appear on on all of our channels and podcasts and stuff and and managed to get it cleaned up just in time for the pandemic to start and for nobody to come. And then uh, it, it, we had, uh, Corey, without any specifics, would it be accurate to say 20 plus people confirmed to to come on out here and, yes. and appear on yeah, things? It was just over 20 people that we had on the books. Yeah, yeah we, we had we had a, a year's worth of content booked, booked, yeah. booked, booked. Some of them with, uh, I got to go dig up that those flight coupons now and find out if they're still any good. Um, and then And then everything shut down. And now there's something about the last couple of weeks. And and granted, it's like I said, this is the middle ground. We're talking about um, instead of three people moving to five to seven people in this operation yeah. in the same place at the same time. But I, I could definitely vouch for the fact that a lot of folks, you know, they, they, they got their poke and they're ready to get, get back to business. Andrew, what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, part of me has running through my head the idea of like, like one is like, uh, I'm having a vaccination celebration party. Hint, hint. Um, you, you, you only come if you're celebrating getting vaccinated. Yeah, but right. But then the people who are concerned about getting vaccinated, whatever it might look, the optics could be really bad there because, uh, I think we're all the school of thought that the way to encourage people to get vaccinated is to not scold people. No. But that but is the minority cool view in the and, media. And, and show how cool and rad and safe it is to be vaccinated and to do cool things because you feel better about it. Yeah. So uh, I think anything that kind of lends its way. I mean, if it was a. If you could do it as kind of a benefit. You know, that yeah. might be an angle like yeah. to help raise money or something for this to like. Uh, for vaccine awareness, sure. you know, it, and then uh, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I, it's a, it's a hard one, but um, uh, well, if if I was gonna make a prediction, if I was gonna lay a bet, uh, I I suspect that an easy middle ground would be to do something like here that is a private event that. You know, sure. and, and, and we can get a few people in the door. You can get your energy vampire on. Yeah. And yeah. Then, I mean, know. I think the, 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 the biggest thing for me is, uh, the return of ambition and optimism because optimism just boy has been taken L's for the last, you know, year, year and a half. Like, there, there was really like no room for optimism over over the last year. As you're like, well, maybe it won't. No, it's it's bad. It's it's worse than we thought. And well, maybe no, no, no. It turns out I'm I'm wrong in May, June, July, August, September, October, November, uh, December, March, April. Ah, now <laughs> we're talking May. Okay, now it's like there is this idea that the, okay, well, well, vaccines are the turning point in a way that. Every other time that we thought something else might be, it wasn't. Uh, and so now it's like, okay, well, let's, how do we gauge the body populace? How do we gauge something that is optimistic and, and, and looking outward, but isn't reckless and isn't 
scary. Like, because because that's what's hard is that we don't know. There is no consensus of like now's the time when we do fun things again. Well, and and as uh, yeah. It, it, the thing is that line is going to be different for everybody and it's going to be a sliding scale for, for different reasons. And I'll, t- I'll tell you what, there are certain parts that, that are just kind of permanently changed. I don't know what about permanently, but, but it will be, it will be months to years before I walk into a restaurant out of courtesy, not, not just wearing a, a, a mask, just, just, just to, just to telegraph that the, I am, I am being courteous, and and yeah. I think that that significant portions of 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 our culture are possibly quasi permanently changed uh, based on that. Um, uh, Corey, you got uh, you look like you got thoughts. Ooh, I I got thoughts first of all on that going to the restaurant without a mask. Yep. Yeah, we went to barbecue today, and I think we were the only ones who ever knew that masks existed. Uh, that and, <laughs> and what's funny is once you sit down and and a beverage is in front of you, it's like well, whatever. You well, know. no, I think he's talking in, in, just, in, just any, in any part yeah, of the process yeah. because uh, uh, as I have learned uh, in my in my month uh, uh, and and change residency here in Austin is that oftentimes I live in Austin. But sometimes I live in Texas <laughs> uh, and, and there is there is there is a difference, especially when you get out out outside or, or even in some certain areas where you're just going to get side eye for the mask because it does have a a a, a, a stigma or 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 other stuff on it. Which, well, I'll tell you what, like bartenders and service workers, they're, they're going to be wearing masks for yeah. for forever and ever and ever. I mean, uh, here, yeah, I'll bet you, though, like, even if you go further out in, in, into Hill Country, that there's probably a bar yeah. operating yeah. right now well, where nobody have, has a mask, and they haven't had a mask in, in months. We went to Lano, Texas, and they all had masks on around their necks, but they did at least have them there. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The, the interest- you know, go ahead, Andrew. Uh, it's a, wait, just real quick, the Elon Musk solution I saw when he moved to Austin is working in Texas is just the bandana. You pull yeah. that over your face and people think you're going to rob a bank, and that's yeah. totally cool. <laughs> it's, it's like, you know what? I double mask. I wear a bandana and this Zorro mask. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're cool. You're cool. All right. Yeah, I've gotten lots of emails and uh, messages from fans that are ready to come back out, people traveling again, wanting to come see the to uh, HQ, hang out, whatever. So I think it's going to be hard to tell. Is it you know when it's time? Because right now, are these just the crazies you know that are asking to come by and the, the crazy fans you know, hardcore fans, um, or is this like no really it's time? Well, well I, you know, I, I I do know that that I listen to a bunch of economics podcasts and and it's a real problem that there are so many job postings that people are are offering signing bonuses at places you wouldn't expect signing bonuses like at Burger King and yeah. uh, and and um they're getting applications but uh and depending and not to get political or whatever but in our rush to make sure everyone's taken care of a lot of people are filling out applications then they're like great you start on Tuesday they're like oh no 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 I don't want the job they're like I don't understand it's like a uh, oh well per the program uh, you know like for number one schools aren't open so I can't leave my kids so I can't but for the program I have to apply for a job I don't have to take the job and so and so as a result like there there's a labor shortage in in markets that are now reopening like restaurants and bars. Yeah. And and you saw that reflected in the in the jobs report on Friday. Yeah. Yeah, I I think I, I don't want to be the first, but I'll wait for a couple other people to like, "Oh yeah, everything's cool and normal." Then I'll be like, "Oh, cool. All right." Yeah. Well, you know, there was a a, a one of my favorite uh, uh wrestling promotions, AEW just announced that they're doing their first live shows since the pandemic and one of them's going to be in Miami, one of them's going to be in Dallas, and one of them's going to be here in Austin and it ha- tickets go on sale this Friday for shows in July and I think I'm going to buy tickets. It's an indoor show, but it's in the middle of July and if I'll, I'll just see if I feel comfortable then if I don't feel comfortable I'll sell them, but like I I kind of feel like well, it, it's, I'm going to be, I'm going to feel good about doing it. I the, think the, well, the, the big question that, that, that we, you know, you're going to want to watch the headlines for those, those lying science headlines that we were just talking about is going to be about whether or not, you know, vaccinated people can carry and be a problem at all. And, and, and the, every week that it looks more and more like that being vaccinated is, you know, being totally immune and you can't carry it, then, uh, then, then 
that's that's your big moral obligation is whether or not you want your name and identity to be associated with running out and and playing in the snow or not. And 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 yeah, that's that's the thing I think from a content creator perspective is is the the, the trickiest thing to do because in a world where going to a restaurant became a like political defiant <laughs> culture war <laughs> political stance and i'm not making a value judgment on it it's just undeniable that that it it became that like it's really hard to like decide now it's like well how where do i end and my public persona uh, begin when does my public persona decide that hey no i want to meet people i want to have a meetup right. Like I want to, I want to go to an outdoor thing and I want to be able to buy people drinks and I want to, to interact with, with people that know who I am. Like I, I got, I, a, I got a taste of that back in, uh, I guess it would have been, um, maybe, uh, October, um, uh, like after I had the full blown disease and yeah. after was, I was completely over it and per the CDC guidelines was cleared. Uh, I said on cord killers, like, uh, Dude, I think I'm gonna go watch a movie. Uh, and and we got emails of of a couple of people. Where they'd be like, "Hey, hey, I know you're joking, but some people might think you're actually going to a movie." And I had to write back. I'm like, uh, 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 "Here's a link to the CDC website saying I could go see. It. Is there something you don't know that I don't that and or that I that, that you know that I don't?" And and he, this person was like, "Oh, I didn't even know that." And so I I, I think. I think it's that it's the rolling wave of information that needs to get out there where people become comfortable with, uh, with F <laughs> actually following the science. I, uh, yeah. Remember the, uh, the study about like, would you wear a sweater worn by like a serial killer, you know, or would you, you know, for how much money you know, to touch this object that has no physical connection to something else, but would you do it? And our aversion to these things is so strong. It's so strong that, yeah. that even, you know, even if it's we're, we understand on an intellectual level that this is fine, that we still have this, ah, oh, and, and you see that really, it's, man, it's, it is frustrating because it's this, like, again, vaccines, we have variants, we don't know, we may need booster shots, all these things are reality, we don't know, we're not like, ah, oh, this, but it is this sort of, uh, some people, there are some people that, I think like to be told what they like that life got very simplified for them. Yeah. There's a way, is that? Well, a I mean, that's certainly it? in line with, as you know, we were talking about the science reporting, people really love to click on those, those dead simple, you know, it's this way. Well, and I mean, even if you change, then it's well, like, well, I got in the best shape of my life during COVID. <laughs> yeah. Like, like I, I, there, there were benefits. I was, very productive during COVID in a way that that is very very hard for me in lockdown. That it was it's very hard for me now to replicate now that I get to do things like see my friends and work with them and, and stuff like that. And so what do you like, want to do? You want to go out to eat? What do they serve at restaurants? You know, crap food and well, sure, yeah. And it's like uh uh, there are benefits, and I think that some people saw those benefits, and and then you you staple that to as Andrew said the uh you know sometimes. Especially when things are scary, people have a tendency to uh, uh, find authority figures for which become maybe outsized in in what would otherwise be the matrix of decision making, uh, and and that's that's the hard part is trying to figure that out now is like all right well then where where are we like I I think we know now the one thing we know for sure is that there's not going to be some some church bell in the center of our, our cultural town square that we're all going to agree when it says COVID's over. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, and like, like that's well, and, not going to happen. And likewise, there won't be somebody else with a bell shouting shame, shame. When you try to have a show. I, I don't, I mean, I apologize. And that's why I, when I watch our political leaders who all been vaccinated, wear masks and there's no doubt that they've been vaccinated. I'm, I'm baffled. Yeah, I'm really baffled. I don't. Well, well, in, 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 and that is a different case because um, in theory, uh, like, I don't know. I, I don't mind wearing a mask, even though I both had the disease and uh, got vaccinated um, just because like ain't no way everyone put in the restaurant to know that, you know. And so I, I assume it's just a, a writ large version of that impulse. Well, I mean, I think the, the biggest thing that we see now is 
we need to do our part to present a culture of blank safety, mask wearing, vaccinations. And, and I think that's where, to me, we get into a very interesting, if a, a tricky argument of like, well, when does the culture, when does that become less of a need? Is it, is it well, tied to a case count? Well, is it tied to a death count? Like, like at, at what point, if we're just saying we all need to be uh, playing a part in creating a culture of mask wearing, and if you do not do your part to, to be part of the culture of mask wearing, then you are derelict in your duty and you are, are dangerous. Like, I, I just don't know where that yeah, ends. Well, and, and we're saying, oh, uh, sorry, Andrew, go ahead. No, oh, please, please, Brian. Oh, I was going to say we're seeing a microcosm of, of that that spectrum right now in the chat. People are, are discussing. There's some people saying that if you're vaxxed and you're wearing a mask, then that's an actively bad thing because you're uh, implying and broadcasting va vaccines don't work. It's all theater and it's bad. Uh, other people are saying, no, it's not black and white. But but keep in mind, um, I, 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 we, we are the laggards compared to uh, uh, Asia in this regard. Like, I don't think it was theater for everybody wearing masks for, for decades uh, over, over there. It was just oh, culturally acceptable. I'm all for, I'm, I, I think, you know, when flu season comes up and yeah. people are bustling through in airports, I think masks are great. I think masks are great. I wish we'd been, I was Mr. Mask. Let me make this very clear. <laughs> I was Mr. I got accused by some, even some of our fans of being fear mongering when we were being told not to wear masks. I'm like, no, wear masks because I'm a dummy, but look at how stars got transmitted previously. Yeah. And, and when, when, and then we found out some health officials were stupid and some were trying to social engineer. And those are two very bad reasons to try to get people to do a thing. Um, and then now, and Andrew's going to say this again, hundreds of thousands of more people would be alive if we were told to wear masks sooner. When, when the actual experts on that were saying, no, it's probably yeah. a good thing to wear them. Hundreds of thousands of people are alive. Our health officials F that up tremendously. Um, but we want to yell at some athlete or some entertainment figure for saying something stupid when the yeah. people we paid to do better. Anyhow, rant over. My point is I'm very pro masking when there's real risk and there is traveling or being around people, whatever. But when you're at a when you watch people literally put on their masks for the press conference and then take it off. Yes. And we know that to me, like that's a lie. That is that is a I'm putting on this symbol. Who who is being persuaded by this? The problem we have now are people who are see the mask coming off and go, no, you're a liar. That's why I don't believe you. That's where we're getting the resistance now. Yeah. And, because and, of the lie. And, and uh, uh, yes, I, I can agree uh, definitely that that it's a uh, 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 being a hypocrite, but, uh, but at the same time, you know, for sure when photos are being taken <laughs> and, 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 you know, uh, it, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, I, I think, it, I think it is imagery in that case. The masks the mass have their time and place. Um, I'm for, I think there are positive things that will come out of this, including the idea, like Andrew said of like, Hey, if you're feeling sick, just wear a mask. If you're on public transportation, if you are, if, if you're traveling, uh, uh, if you're feeling sick, stay home there you, for, for people who work in offices. I uh, see. I don't even know about the, if you're feeling sick, like, like if you are, if you are working at a busy crowded bar where everybody is barking and yelling and breathing on each other's faces and you are the bartender, I would like you to wear a mask always and forever. I can think of virtually no circumstance that I want my service person not wearing a mask. Uh, although that, that sets up a, a, a very, uh, a very weird, uh, uh, two classes of citizenry. Uh, yes. Also unrelatedly, I'm selling masks. So don't believe me. I would, on the messaging point, And that's, that's, a, it's a fair criticism that kind of came up here in the chat is that we get, you know, we get, uh, our president who wears a mask on a zoom conference and maybe there are other people in the room, whatever, but then he's with you know, uh, Jimmy and Rosalind Carter for president Carter and his wife, and there's no mask. And I'm like, yeah. wait, I don't, I don't understand this messaging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, well, I, regardless, I, but the, but the, yeah. the big question of, of what kind of, do you take baby steps or big leaps towards, yeah. uh, towards I think that's, putting that's, on that's, shows and getting in human contact? Can I tell you my plan? Please. So, sure, yeah. In, in the background, um, my one of my jobs is basically to predict what uh, uh, Brian might want. 
So, oh, dear God. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, you shouldn't be <laughs> laughing <laughs> that hard. You shouldn't be laughing <laughs> that hard. <laughs> uh, Brian, have you been working out? Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, been planning on some things in the background. I think, I think some of the things that we should look at doing is uh, early this summer having a very small event here on campus, probably in the warehouse because it'll be you know June and July here pretty soon. Right. Um, doing a small, let's say 20, uh, people event, mm-hmm. uh, very small, just, you know, like basically a podcast or a, a live show or something, something very simple, simple. And that for me, it's on operation side as well as just making sure that we have parking, food, water, bathrooms, all that stuff, uh, figured out. Right. And then this fall doing a, a non founders day event, you know, um, it's yeah. still, it's a little larger, you know, maybe more of the closer to 50 people have a live band. Um, kind Ooh, of figure uh, that the out. suggestion was a small 4th of July gathering. Yep. yep that, like would that. Be, well, that would be, well, that's, that's a, that's a, that one's going to happen Biden regardless. But no. Oh, is it, is, is that, that was, yeah, that was, he, that would be a Biden's, uh, he said in, in a speech that like uh, everybody will be, uh, we should be allowed to have small masked outdoor 4th oh, of July okay, gatherings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, like, wow. Oh, like, man, a lot of these people that have been doing it for six months are going to be uh, <laughs> uh, delighted to know that they're allowed now. Yep. So then we have, a, so this we have the is fall. independence day, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a fall event. That's a little larger, uh, somewhere between 25 and 50 people. And then next spring in April, we have a big, huge monster uh, founders day. And and ultimately, I think hanging over all of this is again our fragile, battered, fledgling optimism that has done nothing but get its face kicked in for a year and a half. And so I feel like even mentioning these plans is we are doing in defiance of listening to God laugh at them because for the last a year and a half, like any idea of like, well, maybe we'll do it blank. Maybe we'll move it back six months. Maybe we'll move it back a year. And it's like, no, no, no. Everything gets canceled. Everything gets moved. Everything is like, like we, we are in, in fear that all of a sudden. Yeah. Oh, wait, hold on. Here's a variant that rips through this, uh, uh, the, the, the vaccines that we have. And now we're, 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 we're back to square one or we're just like, okay, do we just, roll the dice at this point like are are you know how how do we handle it and also how does a populace that is really weary about this handle it and and we're on the fringe cases because we're we're the clowns we're we're the we're 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 the fun stuff that's supposed to take people's mind off off things even me doing politics like i am a more palatable way that people can uh, uh, process this uh, because the news is uh, stressful and weird and people come to me as a, as a salve on that. And it's hard to even think of the, like like what what Corey's saying. Beautiful. I, I hope to God that's, that's a track (laughs) that we can follow because, because it is, it is predicated on the idea that we keep on this track, which I think scientifically Makes Hypothetically. sense. Hypothetically, it makes sense. <laughs> well, but it's, it's, I, it's hard think, to. It's hard. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, when we first when we first went into the lockdown, I mean, to me, it was kind of hilarious because it was like, I'm like, this ends with a vaccine. It's the only that's the that's not because I'm master epidemiologist. It's because every other epidemic we've ever had. Either it, it ends when enough people die off, which is not what we wanted to go, or yep. you come up with a vaccine. Yep. That's that's what it like. It, it's that's it. That's the way it works. It doesn't end like, oh yeah, we all stayed in our home for three weeks and we beat this. Like, no, that's never going to work that way. And that was sort of I was a little frustrated by the messaging, but either here or there. Now it's like I think much like yeah, everybody. Right now, data says these vaccines are pretty good. Let's go about. Let's go about. Everybody can. Everybody now can get a vaccine and wants a vaccine in a couple of weeks time. Everybody who was in a hurry to get vaccinated should be vaccinated. And then to be like, yeah, uh, business is normal. We're pro- we might need a booster shot because these things may mutate. Yep. And let's be ready to go do that. And we're going to be ready to have those. But uh, I, I, let's I, move I, on. I do think it's worth giving a little tip of the hat to the. Um, uh, 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 there is going to be kind of like a cultural PTSD. It's going to take like there, yeah. th- there, there is for uh, let's say twenty percent of the United States, 
this is the most traumatic event of their entire lives. Uh, full, mm-hmm. you know, and and we, you know whether whether you can out traumatic somebody is irrelevant because everybody has their most traumatic thing, and for many people, this was it. And it's going to take some time. And so it's like I'm not in the business of shaming people. What if, if you want to wear a mask forever and ever ever and get it at masks.scamstuff.com. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, then that's fine, and and if you want to take them off, then that's fine. But but both either either way, uh, don't be shaming. Uh, uh, I'm not. No, Brian. Oh no, 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 no. Not, I'm not saying you're doing that. Like, I, I'm I'm saying no. to, just to the world. Yeah, it, it, I mean, yeah. no, I, I'm it, it, saying it, it, that from our our policy point of view is we should say like, hey, you know, by a month from now, every American who who wanted to be vaccinated, yeah. will have the ability to be vaccinated. Yeah. From then on, hey, everybody. Make your own damn choice. Yes, because... yes, and I, I, a hundred percent. And and the question uh, that uh, to loop things back to the beginning is um, uh, obviously here in this forum we don't have a problem saying that out loud. Yeah. Uh, but there's a lot of people who uh, have very good reasons to be gun shy for a very long time about saying that kind of thing out loud. You know, uh, uh, two weeks ago, Ashley and I ate dinner inside as a couple together for the first time. And it was a, a fun little triple date with Brian and Bonnie and Andrew Heaton and his girlfriend. And it wasn't until a couple days later that I realized that we did not do a thing that I assume in every other instance, if we had done this pre COVID would have happened. And that's all of us taking a picture together because that's the first time that we all met we probably all would have like somebody would have said they would have pulled out their phone and had the the server take a picture so we could commemorate this fun event where we all got together. We had such a great time. And I think nobody did it because we no, just assume we're going to do it again. Well, soon. <laughs> well, or also it's like, does anybody feel comfortable posting a picture? Oh, of like, look at us. Like, what are we going to do with it? Like, like, are we going to, are we going to post it and say like, look at us. We all went out like, LOL, no mask, I, hashtag I, no mask. I, <laughs> my argument had been for the, like, I was like on a note. I'm like, I, I was like, I've told friends, like, don't show a vaccine card before everybody can get a vaccine because that's just rubbing in people's faces. Mm-hmm. Now that everybody can get a vaccine. And now that everybody, after the time that it takes for it to set in like six, four weeks from now, six weeks from now, and people have second doses. I'm like, do that because it's like yes you can do this too you can do this too you know that's uh, yeah people are it's certainly possible to take a photo and not post it uh, yes why yes and <laughs> yes and uh, uh i'm uh, i'm i'm sure once you uh, raise your barn you and the others uh, uh can <laughs> yeah. in your village can talk about the cool things that it's you can like, do with yeah, pictures i don't just hire a caricaturist it's great <laughs> yeah I, but it was it was it was a, it was a funny thing that that uh uh, I, I, I only realized after that I'm like any other time somebody would have pulled out their phone and said, this is a great moment. Let's all let's all remember this and, and share it on, especially because we're all media people that like content is our is our business. And we would have wanted to put it up on Instagram or Twitter. Because, oh, of course. Yeah. Just to, you know, be around with each other. But like uh, this is a this is an overhang of, of PTSD and and. Uh, uh, I think from a policy perspective, Andrew, I totally agree with you that that's the direction we should go to the reality of where our culture and on more trick in, in a more tricky way, our audiences will view that is, is the question. And and there is no, there is no mm-hmm. firm answer to it. Like you just gotta baby steps. Mm-hmm. Maybe I do a little uh, just less here. scolding, less scolding. That's my thing. It's just like oh, I, yeah. I have friends that well, aren't going to get vaccinated are hesitant towards doing this. And every talk show or whatever that brings on people to, oh, that's why you do it. And every bit that's done to humiliate those people doesn't bring them closer. And it doesn't make us safer. No, that's no, no, the no. thing that frustrates me is that is that the this the really bad attempts at social engineering on behalf of health officials and the media in general is just like. <laughs> And, and I want to get like we. It's it's almost truly democratic in that all sides have been totally incompetent from the government uh, selling the noble lie and and eroding the trust of the people to you know the populist you know the people on the street raging and throwing masks on the ground <laughs> and shaming people on yeah. both sides. It's like, uh, man, we're gonna we're all gonna look back as a country on on, on this past year and go. <laughs> yeah it's 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 bad uh you know what i 
I understand everybody's got to make their own personal decisions. Uh, uh, I always want to respect that. I do think that there are cultural pressures that that uh, kind of go beyond whatever public messaging is that that is on the side of the vaccines. Um, but uh, in general, the the only thing that I ever want to model is uh, a uh, vaccines are a miracle cure. Nature is out to kill us, and our 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 worth as a as a as a species is beating Mother Nature. Uh, <laughs> we can consistently do it with these miracle drugs in your face, Mother Nature, uh, and uh, they're safe. They're safe based on everything that we that we uh, can see that we know. We don't know everything. We'll never know. Uh, uh, you know, we can't fast forward fifty years. Uh, but everything that we've seen so far, everything we've seen in previous versions of this, we we know what the risks are. Uh, uh, I'm glad that we have a non mRNA option for people that are are weirded out by it for whatever reason. Um, like, I I am. I'm uh, 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 four weeks vaccinated, and boy, do I feel carefree. Like, I just want to do a Virginia Slim ad of me just having a good time and laughing in freeze frame because I got the vaccine. Because I am, I, 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 it is, it is a peace of mind for which I, I could not have paid money for, uh, uh, for the last year. Um, hey, so, um, if if we can slide into picks from that, um, there I, I might have mentioned it before, but uh, I'll double down if I've already mentioned it before. There's a three and a half hour special on Sam Harris's um, Making Sense podcast that is that is a series of of, of um, uh, think pieces and discussions with I forget who the expert is, uh, but uh, but about how uh, exactly what you said, Justin. Mother Nature is out to kill us, and uh, he talks about how. Uh, this was in so many ways a dress rehearsal and we failed miserably, but we learned a lot of lessons. And, uh, and the fact is as equipment gets cheaper and cheaper, people are going to be able to make weirder and weirder stuff in their basements. Um, the, uh, not to scare everyone, but somebody posted on the dark net, the, the, the recipe for smallpox <laughs> to just bring it back. And so, uh, and so, uh, one of the proposals that, that he, he actually, it's very optimistic because he talks about how like, a global organism, we need to build up an immune response for weird stuff by moving faster, just like the body does. And one of the things for that is he proposes for a micro fraction of the amount of money that we spend getting ready for a nuclear attack, which is uh, 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 statistically speaking, not as likely as a pandemic. Uh, uh, we can have a, a militarized response unit to uh, uh, against a, a terrorism attack to uh, uh, to immunize people. And the best part is, let's say nobody ever tries that attack. We know Mother Nature will and we'll be ready for that one. And, and uh, for as much as we spend on the military, uh, I, I thought that was a really encouraging and cool thought. I think I think that we've made so many advances. Great. And <laughs> broken record time. <laughs> the thing that terrifies me, that terrifies me, is that we are in May of 2021, and we still don't know the origin. Yeah. You cannot post on Wikipedia, the regular COVID page, the evidence for a accidental lab leak. Let me preface the accidental lab leak. It immediately gets blocked, and you have to, it goes over to the disinfo page. We do not know the origin. Normally, by this time, we were able to usually trace the origins of things. We've traced the origins of things from 30 and 40 years ago. And part of this is in place because our the, the starting point in China refuses to cooperate in a meaningful way. And that is part of why, remember early on in COVID, I read an article from Ron Bailey who's like, oh, well, we may have this thing beat early because we know we've identified this thing's out and it won't probably won't become a pandemic. And Ron was speaking sincerely because he assumed all the other partners we work with, the other organizations, research organizations, were acting in good faith and not being manipulated from a, a political point of view. Yeah. And that certainly has been the case. And that's what terrifies me, because I think that sounds like a great idea, Brian. But man, that sounds like something could be very easily weaponized against us, too, because we have seen this complete failure of transparency of what's happened. And that that scares me. I'm excited about the mRNA vaccines, the potential for curing cancer and stuff. The things are in front of us. Great. But man, our institutions lack of transparency. The fact that nobody seems to care <laughs> that we can't get teams in to go find out where the hell this thing came from, because how do we know it'll happen again? We don't know. We don't know. Well, it's frozen food. 
but I, it can't transfer that way. Oh, but you know. yeah, I mean that's uh, 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 I have zero tolerance for the what does it matter uh, oh. argument when it comes to the origin. Zero tolerance. <laughs> it matters a lot, and and yeah. and it, it matters that the less we know, the longer we go without knowing. It matters that we understand exactly who is blocking this information because uh, that this is what they're willing to block, like this global implications. And let's understand that, like, all right, we're just gonna get to it. Yeah, no, no, no. Hey, I. uh, 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 Any other fix? (laughs) Uh, 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 Yeah, uh, uh, second season of Cocaine and Rhinestones, one of my favorite podcasts. Uh, This is a lot denser season so uh, i would i would not recommend it to people that are not necessarily country music fans unless you really loved season one but uh uh uh, if you do like country music boy is it a a a very 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 uh a dense walk through uh a bunch of uh, cool trends in country music including in the first episode they go through the history of the trucking song boom. Oh, wow. How, how big uh, a trucking culture kind of became, which it was only in a conversation with our friend Darren Kitchen that I realized we're kind of in a resurgence of with this like van life and, and RV kind of boom that we, that we went through over the last year. But we are, we are currently in another resurgence of the idea that the true American spirit is being untethered uh, and 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 traveling the open roads in our grand expansive country. Bring back the CB, baby. Yeah. Yeah. My pick is uh, follow Matt Ridley's feed because Matt Ridley is working on a book, I believe, on the origins of the virus and you know the story of trying to trace this down. And Matt Ridley is a science writer, I think, is without uh, equal. And so, I think. Uh, you know, follow Matt Ridley. Uh, I think it's Matt W. Ridley. Um, so on Twitter. And there's Elena Chan. She's somebody else worth following. She's been looking She's to the great. origins of this. Great. Yeah. Great, great Twitter follow. And it, you following that, heard following this, it gets frustrating because you realize that, like, these are people like, why don't we just ask this question? Like, we don't need to ask that. We, we already handled it. It's like, no, we just need to know. What about this? That's not important. And you're like, oh. It's, yeah, there's... The problem with our expert culture is that there tends to be a rigidity in things. And the problem is when that rigidity comes in for reasons that might not be the best, uh, it may or may not be protecting unnecessarily an, an authoritarian regime uh, that is uh, a truly scary and awful, um, uh, uh, then, then maybe it's not the greatest. Speaking of would-be dictators of authoritarian regimes, Mr. Corey Cranfield, what's your pick? Yes, my pick is invites. Invites to dinner parties that your friends didn't invite you to. Oh, no! Get out of here! Uh, But all right, I'm going to say it this time. It's been after. (laughs) I I love you guys. Just kidding. Oh, Corey, welcome to the... Oh, there's the Brian and Justin Club over there. Hi, guys. Remember me? No, 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 no. No, Andrew was there. I mean, Heaton, not Maine. uh, We had an Andrew. We had an Andrew. (laughs) One counts. I was glad to hear he's got a steady girlfriend, so... He does. No, she's she's a real sweetheart. She is nice. Because he told me to give the vagabond lifestyle and all this. I'm like, oh no, bro. I don't know. This is like a Seinfeld <laughs> episode. This is coolness. Goodbye, dating life. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, I did. I did shout it. It's been after, but uh, I guess yeah. yeah I gotta yeah. go. Uh, Your stands. Post a video yeah. and uh, and do this. Uh, man, that was a that was a that was a good good ones. Alrighty. Mm-hmm. Mm, 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 mm. Corey, you me barbecue. All right. Hey, uh, I'm out of here. All right, see you, folks. <laughs> Bye, guys. See y'all.